So he's. I, I think he, he can hear us. Okay. Can you hear us, Majid? Oh, no. Something happened. He's not listening. <laughs> Hello, Armando. Hello. <clears throat> hi, hi, Matthias. Hi, Ayman. Hello. Hello to everybody. Good Hi, morning. Matthias. Good afternoon. Hello, Matthias. Yeah. Vladimir. Yeah. Vladimir. Uh, I have to apologize with you because uh, I, I was able to share my screen during your presentation. Oh, no, it's all right. Apologize. Okay, Francisco. Didn't matter. <laughs> it just made the lecture a little longer. And I didn't let the discussion. Oh no! But it, it was very interesting because uh, oh. you say that uh, uh, carotid and arterectomy is uh, the task of surgeons, and I agree completely with you. Thank you. Thank you. Screen sharing. Okay, who's checking now? Uh... Professor Sami. Oh, okay. Uh... Francesco? Yeah. Uh, do you remember our trip to Iran a while ago? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It, was, it was amazing. I, I do not have any pictures. Could you please send me some? Okay, okay. Yeah, Very... thank you. Because yeah. uh, my computer went down and I do not have a single picture. So I, was... I asked Keke, who sent me I... only those where I am, which I do not need. Yeah, so yeah. Please send me something to be so uh... Thank you. <clears throat> Be confident that I will send you. Good. Keki, thanks for them also. Oh, I sent. I was the first one. The moment you in the moment yep. you requ uh, requ requested, I sent it. You did. I got oh, you. Keki. Yes. <laughs> also, Keki was in Iran with us. Eh? Keki, good morning, my friend. Hi, up your up your. How are you? Good morning. Good Thank morning. You. Good morning. Good morning, Thomas. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good afternoon. Okay. It, all, it all depends where are you in the world. It's five five thirty in Mumbai. Five thirty in Mumbai. Five thirty. Yes. Here is uh, Marcos. Yeah. Hi, Jack. You are muted. Take the mask, and you are. You will be unmuted. <laughs> hello, hello, everybody. Hi. How are Good you? to see you. Thank you. So I think we are almost on time and uh, we will proceed. Yesterday we have a very good introduction for this webinar that is a special webinar dedicated to our legendary and close friend and uh, mentor of all of us. Uh, is not along the Silk Road only as said once, but he is the orbit of the globe and uh, Professor Majid Sam. And I gave a very good introduction yesterday. I will cut it short today. And uh, we will be focused on the academic setups. And I'm going to introduce the speakers. This session will be chaired with uh, Professor Ramesh Naim from England. From Majid is calling me, most probably he is. Yes, Major. Yeah, I have no voice. Is that correct? We can hear you. We can hear you, Professor. You, you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Professor. We can hear you now. Yeah, but but I, I cannot hear you. Oh, he's not hearing us. Can we check the audio? Okay. It should be on his side. Maybe. Perhaps I'll check the microphone on your side. Uh, this is awesome. Volume of the computer. No, I, have, I have no morning, no morning. Yes. Good to see you. Is, is you are Moody. muted, uh, Moody. You are muted. Hi, Enrico. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Moody. Hi. Moody. Hi, Pablo, nice to see you. Apio, oh, nice to see you. Marcos. Hi. Hey, everyone's here. Great. Nice to see you guys. Jacques. 
Marcelo. Enrique. Enrique. Oh, oh, Sammy. Okay. Okay. Happy Enrique. 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 Enrique, are you still in Portugal or not? Yes. We still have problems. Did you resolve the, the problems with your computer? I, I, have, I have. I have. Yeah. 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 Because everybody yeah. lives on it. Of telephone, of tel telephone audio. Should I should I change uh, on tele telephone audio? No, you just yeah, un yeah. unmute unmute your. And now hear you well. Try, try again. Try. Let me see if I hear you. Yeah. Can you? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 yes very good. You can, can hear, hear me. Yes. Yes. We can. yes. Well. Yes. Yes. But I cannot hear you. And that is my problem. That is. I don't know. Now, are you using your computer, <laughs> Majid? Are you using your computer or your phone? Because here. I have uh, audio Einstellung, audio video. Hey, Matt, okay. tell him where the mute button on his laptop is, not the microphone, the mute button. He must have it turned it on by mistake. Hi, Jax. Hello. Hi, Jack. Hello, Jack. Hi. I, I love the wall behind you. Is this in Portugal, Enrique? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yes. Okay. yes. There might be the mute button on your computer. Uh, because you see, when I see here, the under the computer is the, is the tone is is open. Yeah. Uh, Video is open. Everything is open. I seem to increase the mute the 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 volume uh, button. button. The, the volume, volume button on the computer. The volume yeah. button, if it can increase. Yeah. Yeah. Here, the no, the if, I, I, if is I push on the a microphone. Yes. No. Now you are muted. Yeah. On, on the, the microphone, it shows you are muted. On the speaker. <clears throat> At the top of the computer. No, no, yeah. oh, I switch on. No. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 No. Yes. 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 Your, your, your microphone, Maji, is working, but your oh, loudspeaker oh, now it's okay. doesn't work. He's not on the phone. You're, now you are on with the microphone, but the speaker of whatever you are using is not functioning. I have. I don't use anything. Always through my. I. Uh, uh, Perhaps you are using the phone or the computer. Imagine. Computer. I'm using the phone. Computer. Should I? Should I go to the? Uh, no, this is because I have done all the time via my computer. Always my presentation. Yeah. Or you have changed the system. Hmm? Uh, Prof. Sami, did you check the volume button on your computer? You did. Microphone test. You know, on your on your uh, laptop yeah, computer. I think so. Yeah, Oscar you, is okay. you check the volume on your computer? Yes, I I, I see here. This is the uh, ask him if he has disconnected the headphone. Disconnected the headphone. Microphone. Uh, I have a list of microphone here, which is uh, uh, of telephone audio. Should I go over telephone audio or computer it's, audio? The problem is not with the microphone, it's the speaker on the computer. I can go by phone if you if you think. You want to, to give it a try? I try now, just a moment. He's going to have a computer. So the first thing is his Bluetooth device connected. Any Bluetooth device. If it is, then the speaker audio is going in there. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. So audio is going directly redirected somewhere else. So, uh, Imad, can you ask him if his Bluetooth is connected by any chance? Uh, they are asking. Uh, they ask you if you have the Bluetooth connected on your phone. 
it should be disconnected yeah he's connected yeah he is connected oh so he should disconnect the bluetooth switch it off yeah. or switch it off can we uh, send him the meeting telephone number id pablo yes i will is the end with 27 uh, pablo uh, i have to check it i i will send it to you i will send it to you imad yeah they he will send it to me and i will forward it to you all right why did this oh, telephone numbers is that yeah yeah i know this is a telephone it's true Hello, Mario. Hey. What time, what time is it in in, in California? In California, it's um, it's five or seven in the morning. Oh God! <laughs> oh, wow. That's well, really dedication. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no problem. This is summertime. Yes, uh, that's that's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> We are here so in winter time, very doing? cold weather. Armando and I have a doing? very cold weather now. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Here, 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 where we are in my country house is zero. Oh. Zero. Wow. No, it's very cold. <laughs> I'm busy with a webinar. Imad, you could ask uh, Prof Sammy to log out and then come back and see whether that works. Yeah. When I call him, but I'm waiting for Pablo to send me the phone uh, connection to the webinar. Almost there, Imad. Almost yeah, there. Okay. Take your time. I'd like to apologize to the people attending this webinar that we are have a little bit of delay. The guest of honor has problem with the connection. I hope it will be sorted out shortly. Now, Imad, your WhatsApp. Imad, we wait for uh, the solution. This is no. very important. Maybe the problem is that because they lost to England yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably the reason. <laughs> <laughs> Latin American so football crazy, you know. <laughs> the image shows that the uh, Majid is still connecting to audio. Quite a long time. Do you see it on the on his image? Yeah. Yes. He should click the join with computer audio button right now. Mm -hmm. You may have to tell him that, uh, Imad. I think uh, sometimes uh, you miss that button, and that's what's happened. Mm. Yeah, should one send a picture of the button to show to him? We have to go back, I guess. Oh. Oh, I, I think leaving the meeting and joining again might be the option. I think yes, but if he doesn't know the button, yeah. doesn't help. Look, at all. I send it to you, but yeah, but I want to tell you if you can check out completely from the computer, and we we uh, connect, and and when you have the audio joined with video and audio, try this one. Yeah, it will work. Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> so he will start his computer again. Yeah. So, Jack, what is on the uh, on the menu today? I'm seeing you well dressed for that. Yes, yes. I actually have to operate, but I'm be watching the whole time. So we, uh, I just have a large uh, medial sphenoid wing meningioma. Oh, I see. Not for no speaking, hopefully. 
<laughs> what? <laughs> Not for no speaking procedure. Yeah, Not right. for <laughs> Landevo is with us as well. What's saying? He's not awake. Muted. He's muted. I am okay. Hi. I'm happy to see many friends. Oh, Landevo. And Professor and, uh, and, uh, Abdus Salam yeah. is with us today as well. Why are you? Hello, Mario. everybody. Ciao, Landevo. Ciao. Uh, Hi. Hi. Hello, Marcos. Hello, Francisco. Hi, Professor Tomazello. How are you, Enrique? Hi. Vladimir. Hello. Okay. Come on, bye. Come Hi, on, bye. Yes. Hello, how are you? Good to see you here. Oh, thank you. You're feeling cold. Are you feeling cold? Yeah, it's a little bit cold in Rio. 17. 17. <laughs> 17, <laughs> eh? it's good for us. It's yeah, good for us. But Not Mario, like you, Mario you need better lighting in your room. It's dark, Mario. I know. <laughs> it's five o'clock in the morning. It's not, it's not a completely awake. Yes, Tonight. five o'clock in the morning. Let me try to put some more light. Five o'clock, what do you need? You need indoor light. Oh, now we can you see. Know, yeah. Now you can see me better, huh? Very much so. <laughs> okay, Majid, do you hear us? Uh, oh, connecting to audio, yes. Yeah, I think he must be he's muted now, but he should be able to you hear. You are unmuted, Majid. Unmute yourself. On the microphone sign, yeah. Speak, please. Yes, you can hear me? Yeah. Very well. Yeah, very well. Can you hear us? You can All hear. right. You, I can hear now, yes. Wonderful. Yeah, I think the problem was not in my yeah. side. The problem was coming. For, I was excluded of the of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> this one we are not going to take it, Magic. <laughs> oh, the, the, the technical part. The technical part believes I am not belonging to the faculty. I should only listen to you, but not have any any. Uh, that's impossible. That's impossible. <laughs> yes. But yeah. but you must mention I do it as always. I did yeah. nothing wrong. And here, All right. yeah. Okay. Okay, I think I we accept that. Was... Technique oh, yeah. is always you see, you see yesterday German soccer they have lost, you know, no <laughs> problem anymore. <laughs> So welcome all of you and thanks for attending this special webinar honoring Professor Majid Sami, our legendary mentor. And uh, any award, it will be a minor for him. He got all the award around the world and all the recognitions. And without further ado, I will proceed with the uh, presenting the speakers of this session. So I will be uh, up with the as a moderator, Professor uh, Ramesh Nair and Professor Matthias uh, with us from uh, Argentina. So the speakers for today will be Professor Keki Torel, he's the chairman of World Federation Neurosurgery Committee of Complication in Neurosurgery. And we have a close collaboration because we always feed him with a lot of complications. <laughs> And uh, he is the uh, chairman, uh, emeritus, and professor and senior consultant in Mumbai. And then he will be followed by Professor Lokas uh, Vasuli from Serbia. Uh, he is professor at the university and he is the Congress president for the uh, European uh, Association of Neurological Surgeons for 2022. And he is the chair for the Committee on Peripheral Nerve by the World Federation. Also, Moody Kurashi from Kenya, our close brother and friend, is a professor at the Aga Khan University, Nairobi. He is the president of the CANS, the uh, 
African Society of Neurosurgery, Chairman of Neurological Society of Kenya, and he is co-chair of the World Federation uh, Committee on Neuroendoscopy. Uh, professor Mario Amirati, he is a professor and chairman emeritus, he is the director of innovative uh, neurotherapeutics research program at Sparrow Health Research Park and senior neurosurgeon affiliated with Indiana University Army Hospital. Then myself, I'll be presenting. I'm working in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, at King Faisal Specialist Hospital. Be followed by our dear friend, uh, Professor Armando Pastro from Argentina. He is a professor and chairman emeritus. He is an honorary president of the World Federation of Neurosurgeon, and he has a major impact on the World Federation Education Foundation and teaching. Uh, our friends, uh, Jose Landero from Brazil, he is professor and chairman, and he is the World Federation Skull Base Committee co-chair on Skull Base. Uh, our colleague, uh, Professor Juan Stefan Florian from Romania, he is professor and chair at uh, Ludio uh, Aji Gano. Uh, am I pronouncing it correctly? And he is director of the University Senat Kluk uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Romania. Also, uh, Abby Anton Antones uh, from Brazil. He is professor and head section of neurosurgery, Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. Our dearest friend, uh, brother Jack Mokos, is a professor and co chair of the Department of Neurosurgical Surgery at the University of Miami and Professor of Clinical Neurosurgery and Otolaryngology, Director of Cerebral Vascular Surgery, skull based Surgery at the University of Miami, and has a major input on education worldwide, and is a, uh, a favorite invitee to many uh, courses and meetings. And he's the Vice President of the American Association of Neurological Surgeon and the Chairman of the World Federation Constitution and Bylaws. Uh, here, I will stop one word and I will say, uh, we all know uh, about our dearest friend and colleague, God bless his uh, health, also uh, Fed Gentili. He was on the phone with me yesterday and uh, with uh, Jack Mokos. He was very keen to attend this webinar. And uh, due to his sickness, and he's under treatment right now, uh, post-surgery, he extends his apology to all of you. The best statement I heard from him that it gave me the feeling he will overcome his problem. He said, count on me on the next webinar. So please pray for him and keep giving him the spiritual and the moral support. He is in need to lean on friends. And uh, last but not least, the session will be concluded with Professor Majid Sami talk on uh, teaching and education. Without further ado, I'll ask uh, Professor Ramesh Nair to start the session. Thank you. Thank you, Mud. Um, and um, you've done the introduction and uh, introduced uh, introduced all the speakers. So I'll start without much further delay. I'm very, uh, it's my pleasure to call my dearest friend, uh, Prof. Keiki Turel, um, to talk on the favorite subject for all of us, really, on the complications and the legalities and, and the challenges with it. Um, Keiki, the topic is for 15 minutes. Uh, and the discussion will be five minutes, so uh, we'll be monitoring. And if you wish, we could give you a warning in one or two minutes before you end the talk. I can unmute yourself uh, if you could. Uh, you haven't? Can you unmute? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, thank you very much. Namaste. Namaste has become now a, a uh, common uh, way of greeting in the Corona times all over the world. So my greetings to you. 
I'm grateful uh, and uh, thankful to Imad and Vladimir for hosting this wonderful meeting on inspiration and innovation of Majid Sami School of Neurosurgery and, uh, and honoring his lifetime achievements. It's indeed a great pleasure to have him also today with, amongst us. As you know, his philosophy of keeping the doors open for sharing innovation with neurosurgeons all around the world and discussing various advances in his brave, over -expanding, ever expanding field of neurosurgery. Innovation and education have been the password for him. We take pride in having spent a variable period of time and for all of us that period must have been the most crucial part of our life as he guided us as a beacon of light. And how can I ever forget my original stay with him in 1983 to 85 in Hanover and he changed my career as much as he has done of all those people who have worked with him or even visited him. We call him Magic Sammy because he has magic in his hands, whether he's operating or playing music or playing golf, or in, now he plays sitar, star, does a, a string instrument. So uh, on, uh, I may again say welcome because welcome to all the people from all over the world because uh, Majid Sami's legacy of innovation and education is spread all around the globe and his universe is diverse. People from diverse countries, but united together. So this is his world, unity in diversity. And looking at the program today, we see there are more than 20 lectures and speakers from I think 15 countries of this initiative of Neuroanatomy Committee. In fact, it feels like as if it is an interim meeting of Massin itself. You know, we have had seven meetings and the next one is going to be hosted by Jacques. So these are the last seven meetings that have been there in various parts of the world. And this is me with him at one of the recent meetings in uh, Montenegro uh, four years ago. So let me come back to this great issue of complications, which I have been uh, keenly connected with. Um, and this time I'm going to talk to you something different. I'm talking to you on ethics, morals, and legalities that concern complications in neurosurgery. I have nothing to disclose except complications. I have seen them all. I wonder if all of you have also. So let's talk about ethics and morals and legalities. Let's start with the definition of complication, which is a secondary disease or condition which makes an already existing one worse and an unfavorable evolution or consequence of a disease or health or therapy. Now, ethics, since we're talking about ethics, morals and legalities, is moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity. And medical ethics means moral principles that govern the practice of medicine. So ethics vary from time to time, place to place, generation to generation. It is not something that is absolute. In our field of medicine, which is, as you know, very uncertain, there are no guarantees, even though our patients always ask, what is the guarantee that this operation will succeed? We know our knowledge and experience individually both have limitations, but together, we would love to have the kind of wisdom our mentor has shown. Professor Sami's knowledge and experience combined together is a wisdom which we have, which we have found it very, very hard to find. So, By using experience, knowledge, and insight, our ancestors recognized that they could anticipate dangers and opportunities and take steps to exploit advantages and avoid hazards. Our life tragedy is that we get old too soon and wise too late. That's the unfortunate part. But erando discutio, we learn by making mistakes. We all make mistakes. And the important thing is that we should learn from them. Success is normally found in a pile of mistakes. We always say to err is human. I always say everyone makes a mistake, but only fools repeat them. So whilst to err is human and to forgive is divine, I would say that to err is human and learning is divine. Learning from mistakes. Learning from mistakes is what we are trying to talk about today. And remember your best teacher is your last mistake. But in medical practice, mistakes are not allowed and they are seldom forgiven. For example, if you see this epitaph, this is the gentleman who died in India in 2001, and it is mentioned on his tombstone that he died due to negligence of a particular hospital and a particular doctor. And this is a fact. It is better to be etched in the memory of people rather than on the tombstone. 
you would agree with that. So, every medical field has complications and those in neurosurgery can be devastating. It's an unfortunate part of surgery which makes the consequences worse than the original disease and bringing great suffering to the patient, to the family and tarnish the reputation of the surgeon and our own specialty at large. So complications can be intra or post-operative and they can be surgical or medical. The two sides of the coin of complications are very important. One is prevention or anticipation or avoidance and the other side is management. And this management can be both immediate intra-procedural and late and late can be concerning both the patient as well as the family. So anticipation, as I said earlier on, is the most important, it's a keystone to prevention. If you can prevent complications, uh, there was no question of even management. So there are five P's, we call it, proper planning prevents poor performance. So if you spend more time preparing, you will spend less time repairing. I always said it is easier to stay out of complication than to get out of a complication. And that is apl applicable to every aspect of life. Anticipation, of course, helps. So anticipation comes by knowing the patient's history and investigation, and here, experience counts. We know from Hippocrates, father of medicine, for more than 2,500 years ago, he said, primem non nocera, at first do no harm. It means you know your own limitations. If you're not equipped in whatever way to do full justice to your patient, please don't touch him. I trust him and trust him to a colleague who can handle it the way it should be. It is, of course, more easily said than none because we surgeons tend to be highly egoistic at times. But I must tell you that you will never lose a patient if you send him to the right place. On the contrary, you will gain his trust or confidence and respect. So it's always better to prevent than to cure and ensuring the safety of our patients is far more important than elimination of the disease itself. If complete resection, of course, of the lesion is achieved, it would be a bonus. We know that this prevention search safety list has been prepared by WHO several decades ago. And this safety list is there now being followed all over. And some modification, however. So you have this sign in, sign time out and sign out. That means before induction of anesthesia, before skin incision and before the patient leaves. We have these kind of uh, checklists, which we have acquired, as you must have known, from the airlines, from the aviation companies. They have such strict, rigid protocols. And we have learned indeed in medicine, these checklists are so important. So as, as I always said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So many prevention methods are there. Primary prevention means you checklist and protocols for error avoidance. The secondary checklist means you look at medical records, take informed consent of the patient. Tertiary prevention means then once a complication has occurred, you take legal advice and obtain medical immunity. And the next long-term prevention, quaternary prevention, is go through medical legal reforms and support groups. Ten, ten years ago, uh, we found from this journal of uh, medicine that legal claims in neurosurgery tops the list of all medical and surgical specialties. And you can see here, you must understand neurosurgery is delicate and nervous system is unforgiving. We make errors, make errors all the time. Uh, there is nobody who has not made an error and if he has says that he hasn't done, he, he has either not done enough or he is probably lying. Error is a state or condition of being wrong in behavior, conduct, or judgment. It's a failure of a planned action to achieve its intended outcome. A deviation between what was actually done and what should have been done. A good definition, which is very easy to remember, is doing the wrong thing when meaning to do the right thing. That's an error. It's a mistake. But medical errors in neurosurgery you need to differentiate between errors and complications. So, where do we stand? According to the IM report, preventable medical errors lead to deaths of at least 100,000 Americans every year, and it costs them 17 billion per year. Of these medical prevent errors, the top four out of five are belonging to our specialty. Post-op infection, device failure, fail back syndrome, operative hemorrhage. And to what degree neurosurgery contributes, you can see these errors. We come to the last part, the legalities, which is the most important as it seems today. General principles for minimizing legal action. Right from the beginning that you start your staking your patient up, you must make the whole family your allies. Win their confidence. Be kind, extend courtesy at all times. 
have careful detailed record keeping of the findings that you find on the history and clinical examination, explaining and documenting pros and cons of each test, each, each step in treatment, and take written, written consent wherever it is required. Please pay a prompt attention to symptoms, concerns, and ensure that the patient and family trust you. When I was a scout, we were uh, uh, taught by our scout master, you know, this Baden Powell, he was the founder of scouting, which, and I really owe my life to what I learned in scouting. And scouts, scouting helps us to be prepared by previous thinking and practicing how to act on any accident so that you are never taken by surprise. You must know exactly what to do when something unexpected happens. This is what I learned in scouting when I was at school. I didn't realize how applicable it will be when I become a neurosurgeon. And then, of course, smile and whistle under all circumstances, avoid panic. This is my picture when I went to Delhi for a scout camp along with our Prime Minister, first Prime Minister of India, Nehru. You must realize it is very important to be humble. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And humility helps when you are faced with a legal problem. Putting on scrubs is an invitation to be that compassionate person reaching out to the world in a responsible way to help in the midst of suffering. So maintain humility at all times, whomever you meet, however low, lowly placed the patient may be a poor person, please be humble with them, be polite with them and help them. This is really the sign of your education. Approach each procedure with respect. Remember pride, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Pay attention to cautionary warnings. They, these warnings may come from your anesthetist, from your colleagues, they may even come from your junior residents, from your nurses, from your orderlies in the wards. So please take their advice. Listen to what the people have to say. Ego is a sense of self-esteem or self-importance and ego is good, but we surgeons sometimes have a super ego. And this super ego can be very injurious to ourselves and to our patients. So surgeons must let go the ego because that is the one which comes in the way of providing less patient care. If complications occur, you must take responsibility for your own cases and results. That's commitment. You may have to spend your own time and money, perhaps out of proportion to your earning. But then, well, that's what you have to prepare yourself before wielding the knife. And if you have done good surgery, be it so. You know, it is expected out of you. Nobody expects you not to do it. But if you have made a mistake, you need to stand up and you need to correct it. You may need help, you may need guidance, you may need a second opinion. Please take it. You owe that to your patient. I'll introduce you to some legal terms in the closing remarks now. Negligence. Deficiency in providing reasonable skill and care. There's negligence. Harm caused by carelessness. Lapses in warning the patient and family about possible harm. Ensuring safety. Act of commission or act of omission. And finally, the error of judgment where a competent neurosurgeon with similar skills would not have made this mistake. That is negligence. But negligence is not always punishable. It may not be punishable. It may be an error which occurs despite reasonable skill and care. If it can be proved that this harm occurred from an unexpected accident, if the complainant cannot prove that medical deficiency on part of the surgeon, and when your respected colleagues give a statement that there was no wrongdoing on your part, the complication is inherent to the procedure which you should have explained to the patient, mind you, and that you did everything possible to rectify the matters. In our own India, country of India, where we have the Supreme Court now, it takes up the matters and they have mentioned that doctors can be implicated unless negligence is gross. And now they have set up an 11 point norm on what is the meaning of medical negligence. And this has come now officially and legal document. So it is only a breach of duty or an act which a prudent and reasonable man will not do, and so on. There are 11 points over here. What is my practice? Injure your death following evangelism or, deliberate, or deliberate deviation from accepted standards of practice. For example, performing a procedure without obtaining consent, which is absolutely basic. Operating on the basis of a wrong diagnosis. Performing procedures which have not been validated by peers. That means it may be an experimentation or it may be an unnecessary surgery. What is an adverse event? It's an undesired patient outcome that may or may not be the result of an error 
or it may be on an, an incident which resulted in harm. Eventually, an adverse event results in harm to the patient. And we come now to never events. Never events are errors in medical care that are clearly identifiable, preventable, costly, and serious in their consequences. These events which should never occur, they indicate a real problem in the safety and credibility of our healthcare facility. For example, if you are done on a wrong body part, any operation, if you left a foreign body in a patient, if you had a mismatched blood transfusion or a major medication error, these are adverse events. Now, what do you do after a complication occurs? What steps do you take? Please explain immediately to the patient and family with a rational explanation of why there was a complication. For example, if a complication occurs during the operation, the entire team must get together and present a common front. You, the doctor, the anesthetist, the junior doctor, and everybody in a the theater must have a common formula. Different people must not talk different things. Otherwise, the patient will immediately get suspicious. So you must have me speak one common language and therefore it is the responsibility of the surgeon to do this kind of a, uh, a preparation before talking to the family when a complication occurs inside the operating room. But you must remain honest and truthful. Do not be evasive, shifty, vague. You should tell them. You may sometimes not tell them every bit, but still be quite honest and, and be open. Do not shift the blame on others, especially not on the junior members of the team. Oh, he tried to open and he, he opened up the vertebral artery or the carotid artery. Oh, no. That's, you are supposed to be responsible for it. And provide patient and detailed responses to whatever queries the family is opposing. Emphasize that everything possible is being done to help the patient. You must show your concern and willingness to help by your actions. Frequent visits to the patient. And on each occasion, make a careful examination. On each occasion, discuss with your colleagues, your resident doctors, your nurses, and bring in other consultants who may be of help to you with regard to the patient care. Briefing, briefing the patient and the relatives after each visit on progress or on the lack of progress, whatever it is, and encourage the relatives to visit the patient and interact all the time with your staff. Two more minutes, sir, KK. Sure. So if a complication occurs, I'm going to overstep the time. That's a complication, huh? So open disclosure. What is the disclosure? A complication occurring during the surgical procedure, like a difficult situation for a surgeon. They are anxious moments for relatives and patient. Misinterpretation and mistrust, jeopardizing the doctor-patient relationship. So you must be very careful how to disclose a complication. It really looks very, very shabby at the end. A sudden death on the table in a healthy young patient poses a serious challenge to the operating surgeon, even though he or she may not be directly involved. So an open disclosure is an open, consistent approach to communicate with patients and relatives when things go wrong in healthcare. And this includes expressing regret for what has happened, keeping the patient informed, providing feedback on investigations and the steps taken to prevent recurrence of such an adverse event. And we have, in, we have faced this problem in India, the fury by mob, the, the, the angry relatives of the family, they keep, they damage the, they hammer the patient, they, they hammer the doctors, the nursing staff, and they damage the hospital property. So this is something that is happening now a little more frequently, and this is something that should not be allowed to happen if you communicate properly. If you communicate with the families properly, this sort of a thing is not likely to happen. So please keep the communication channel open at all times. <clears throat> and if you are sued, prepare your defense carefully and well. Consult an experienced and wise lawyer. Provide testimony of your qualifications and expertise. Emphasize all the steps taken to provide reasonable care. Provide photocopies of consent form, patient's case sheets, operation notes, videos, whatever you have and obtain opinions from respected senior colleagues on your case. Remember that the judge will pay special attention to those opinions and which the experts have given from big hospitals. And then provide photocopies or reprints of statements on this complication from recent international and national textbook journals. You know that we are having a platform of neuro complications uh, on, our, uh, on our webinars. And we have now already listed at least 700 presentations of complications um, on our platform. You can refer to them. And if you, are, if, you are, if you encounter such a complication, please refer to our webinar platform and you will be able to quote it. 
So remember that a complication is well known to occur in such procedures and analysis. You can prove that, and the measures described to prevent and treat the complication are the ones which are followed by you. Finally, I will say one more time: remember, it is easier to stay out of complication than to get out of complication. Please prevent prevent them from happening and anticipate them. Anticipation always helps. My last slide. If you must play, decide upon three things right at the start: the rules of the game, the stakes, and the quitting time. So here is a time for me to quit. But before I quit, let me tell you one more time that we have these ongoing neuro complications learning series. We are going on to next chapter six, and we are going to have the second edition of what we had last time. We are going to discuss major complications with minor surgeries. Lessons learned from these small, minor, so-called minor operations. Like borrowed drainage of chronic subdural convexity meningioma, brain abscess aspiration, or glioma from a non-eloquent area, tenoplasty complications, shunt complications, EVD, ETV, lumbar disc microsurgery or endoscopic surgery, ACDF, carpal tunnel. These are all relatively minor procedures, but they may have major catastrophe. So we are going to discuss that one more time on 30th of July in the evening on Friday. So you can register. Right now, and please send your presentations. Uh, it will be a 15-minute presentation time for each uh, presenter. Thank you very much for being so patient with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, KK. Uh, that was a very uh, thought-provoking talk. Lots of wise wisdom and wise words in there. Um, I think we've finished the time for this talk. Um, if any questions. Ramesh, yeah. sorry before you put the question, I have to do a special announcements when you are finished with Kiki's if you have any receiving any questions or anything sure. special. I can't see any questions on the chat group yet, but uh, feel free to uh, send questions through the, the question uh, chat box and we will answer it. I think anyone... I can go ahead. Yeah, you can carry on, uh, Imad, if you want well, to. Uh, I'd like to give a special announcement. Uh, Professor Francisco Tomasello, who kindly accept to give his presentation that could not be transmitted yesterday, today. We are privileged to have him. He is a professor and chairman at Messina, Italy. And he is an honorary president uh, of the World Federation and a major contributor to education. So welcome, Professor Francesco, and your presentation will be uh, in joint venture before Professor Majid Sam. Thank it's you. a privilege, but it's not so easy. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Imad. Um, I cannot see uh, Professor Lucas Rasulik, uh, the next speaker, um, on the um, screen here. So we'll go for the next uh, talk um, from Professor uh, Mohamed Qureshi, who's another great friend of mine from Kenya, uh, professor of neurosurgery at Aga Khan University. And uh, favorite topic uh, from Moody is uh, um, the childhood hatchcephalus. And uh, we all uh, look forward to your talk, uh, Moody. And you have uh, 15 minutes for talk and five minutes for discussion. So I'll, let, I'll give you a warning two minutes before. Um, you can unmute and then start talking. Thank you very much, uh, Ramesh. Once again, it's an honor and a privilege to be talking on such a forum, which is uh, uh, dedicated uh, or to Professor Majid Sami's lifetime of achievements. So Imad and Vlad, thank you for thinking of me and giving me this stage. Uh, I'll share my screen. I believe you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Thank you very much once again. And the topic I shall have is inspired uh, by many in this forum. And I know a lot of people have done a lot of work in this, but I shall present my humble view on this. And in our part of the world, it is certainly one of the most ruthless of maladies that we see. And it is particularly vicious all across the low and middle income countries globally. This is an image from Tanzania, where just on one mission, 
you will see the kind of list that we have for desperate patients who come from across the 70 million population of Tanzania. And we were supposed to have a, uh, Professor Majid Sami's project in East Africa, and that is where we were hoping to have it, but we will uh, in due course. The challenges that we face in our part of the region and in many low-income countries is the large volume and mix of patients, the infrastructure paucity, the equipment needs that are huge, the neurosurgical manpower capacity, which is very low, and the availability of specialists in our allied um, specialties. And of course, it also is a great challenge posed by the diverse types of hydrocephalus that we see. Here we see anatomical anomalies within the ventricular system. This is an image on an endoscope, which we have now started referring to as the cheetah uh, skin appearance when you do the endoscopy. There is tuberculosis, which makes it very difficult to treat. There are posterior fossa lesions. There are multiseptate uh, hydrocephalus. So there's a huge array of cases that provide a clinical challenge in their management. And how do we rise to this challenge? We've tried in our part of the world to do collaborations to enhance our neurosurgical capacity, ensure appropriate and adequate training, seek funding to acquire equipment, be certain about the indications of treatment. And of course, as this is the topic of the day, be very well aware of the knowledge of microsurgical endoscopic anatomy of the condition you're going to treat. And it is an opportune moment to thank Professor Majid Sami for the many things he has done for us, particularly in Africa and East Africa. He has uh, made efforts to augment many continental uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, his Africa 100 is globally well known. And here he is with the first uh, recipient of the Africa 100 female uh, who is now qualified and working in the country where I've just shown you those hydrocephalus pictures. And here he is launching with us the Africa 100 program in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, where uh, it, has, it took off and has become so hugely important for our part of the world. And again, at this forum, he initiated the formation of our Continental Association of African Neurosurgical Societies. And this is now one of the very vibrant continental society ever since Professor Majid Sami in January 2012 uh, collected all our African colleagues from across the continent. They all arrived in Nairobi for a symposium. Uh, and at that symposium, we launched the Continental Association. So truly a uh, huge amount of uh, uh, thanks to Professor Sami and the Africa 100 was, is aiming to, to train 100 uh, young African neurosurgeons. And already we have many who have gone through that. Uh, it is currently in Algeria and Morocco, but Nairobi is also accredited for the program. With regards to hydrocephalus, Professor Majid Sami contributed to the uh, WFNS hydrocephalus project in Kyrgyzstan, and where with colleagues, Professor Maurice Schuss and Professor Di Rocco, uh, they're doing a huge amount of work they are, uh, and contributing hugely. Uh, this is a project that provides teaching by neurosurgeons and nurses from INI, and the foundation that he's supported uh, brings operating rooms, microscopes, endoscopes, cranial sets, uh, anesthesia equipment, operating tables, all uh, worth over 200,000 US dollars. As I said, an East African project was on the cards, but due to the pandemic, it has just been delayed. And I look forward to hosting Professor Majid Sami for this project in East Africa. The WFNS has been supporting us in this project. And here we see uh, Professor Miguel Arias, along with others and uh, uh, Professor Vladimir and Imad, we were all in Mombasa trying to help meet the challenge of hydrocephalus. Then there is the challenge of facilities. Here is a mission where we are operating in one operating room, two uh, patients at the same time with, uh, with endoscopy. Uh, quite clearly a condition that brings out the uh, humility and the giving spirit in world-renowned uh, colleagues. Here is Professor Shazuo Oi, who, who developed the 
Oi, Handy Pro, along with Professor Majid Sami and Ini, and Professor Shazua Oi is here in very modest facilities in Tanzania, trying to help us meet the challenge of hydrocephalus in, in our region. Of course, this is East Africa is where uh, CPC was introduced at a small hospital in, in, in Uganda by Ben Wolf and is now a subject of much discussion and uh, helping many patients. So decision-making in hydrocephalus is where the issue lies. What is the underlying pathology? Where along those anatomical structures does the pathology lie? Does it indeed warrant treatment? Because there'll be some patients that it becomes a moral dilemma to go ahead and treat. What option should we utilize? Is it, is it a shunt that's the best option? Is it a programmable shunt or is it a, a straightforward chabra shunt from India? That is what we should use, ETV, or indeed, is there a role for microsurgery? What is best suited for the uh, particular child? This demonstrates how, you know, how recent shunts were introduced in some parts of East Africa. This is the first shunt being done in July 2004 for this child in Zanzibar. So although it has been treated for over a century, it is in some parts of the world coming in for the first time. And this is in July 2004, when the first shunt was placed in that island. So in line with today's uh, 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 webinar on neuroanatomy, uh, those uh, young neurosurgeons and trainees who are listening, please let anatomy be your guide. And this is showing us where we usually either put in the shunt what, where the hydrocephalus is, a, is causing the problem. And adjacent to that are many, many important structures uh, that you need to be aware of. There is the internal capsule, there is the thalamus, there is the caudate, uh, there is in the aqueduct, uh, the midbrain is just there. If you're trying to do an aqueductoplasty, you need to know how close you are to the midbrain and uh, how close you are to the fourth ventricle. So all these structures must be very well embedded in your mind before you do any surgical procedure. The anatomical landmarks are very straightforward, but they're around very, very critical structures. And you must recognize all of these structures before you endeavor either a shunt or an ETV or indeed any microsurgical procedure. And uh, the, the time is not enough for, go, for us to go through each of these, but do learn your anatomy of these vital structures. This is the view that you enter when you enter into the lateral ventricle, for example. You must know how to find that foramen of Monroe. Uh, sometimes the ventricles are so large that you don't see anything. Just patiently look for uh, the, the thalamus triad vein, look for the choroid plexus. Where it is, is where you are going to find uh, the foramen. Sometimes there is no foramen that you see, there is no septum that you see, and it's all one watery field. You then need to start knowing how to look for your mammalian bodies, know how, where to perforate, and then know when you have actually done a proper ETV by looking at the basal systems. This is a view taken from below the third ventricle, looking up into the uh, lateral ventricles. And there is the telechoroidea with the foramen of Monroe and the phonics. Uh, know what is on both sides of that uh, floor uh, so that you're very well versed with the anatomy. The telechoroidea is, uh, one needs to know where it is, how it is, how it is formed as a double layer of pyometer and how it goes from the inferior uh, cerebellar peduncles from the foramen of Mujondi going laterally to the foramen of Lushka. Learn this like the back of your hand so that one knows what we are looking at. This telechoroidea is a highly vascularized loose connective tissue portion of the pia mater found in the ventricular system, giving rise to the choroid uh, pia mater. In the lateral ventricle, it lies along the choroid fissure in the medial wall of the ventricle. Its blood supply supplies the anterior choroidal artery of the internal carotid artery and several choroidal branches of the posterior uh, cere cerebral artery. In the third ventricle, it is found in the roof, as we just saw earlier. 
supplied by the posterior choroidal arteries. In the fourth ventricle, it's located in the roof and supplied by the inferior cerebral arteries. Know where it's supposed to be and know what it's uh, supplied by. Here is an image of the third ventricle when you're seeing it from the, uh, anteriorly through the lamina terminalis. Here is the optic chiasm. Here is the uh, A1 of the anterior cerebral going to the anterior communicating artery and the anterior opening into the third ventricle is through the lamina terminalis. The third roof of the third ventricle formed by the telechoroidia uh, will also be seen here. So these are all structures that you see from the front going into the third ventricle. Uh, we cannot go through each of these for sake of time. The point I'm trying to make here is you can get to uh, the route to Mecca is through many uh, areas, but you have to know which route you want to take and know what is uh, what are the structures. The anterior, the A1s, the anterior communicating artery, as I said, and just below, you can get into the uh, uh, third ventricle through the opening in the lamina terminalis. Uh, know what structures are above that, the A2, where it runs into the, uh, into, in, in the interhemispheric uh, uh, space. So here is the optic chiasm, the anterior communicating artery, there is the lamina terminalis, and once you get in, you can then visualize the various structures within the third ventricle, the optic chiasm, the massa intermedia, the mammillary bodies are all then visible for you. When you're going in from below, uh, as Zimad pointed out, uh, you can, uh, going through picking the nose, you must realize that you can get into the third ventricle from below. There are, the, and re recognize that the posterior communicating arteries are really not very far apart and they're usually just about 11 uh, to 11.3 millimeters apart. So know how close you are. As Keki mentioned, you can get into trouble if you don't know how far these vessels are and how, or rather how close they are. This is the endoscopic view when you, of the structures at the foramen of Monroe. As you enter them, you must be able to recognize what you're looking for uh, in, on a good day, you, one, one sees those mammillary bodies very clearly. You see your basilar artery very nicely. You see the infundibulum, the optic chiasm, the clivus through a very nice floor of the third ventricle, but it's always not that uh, plain to see. And one must therefore know what structures are there below these uh, before you do your endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Uh, and again, looking at it from posteriorly, you can see the mammillary bodies, the tubercinarium and the infundibular recess. And if you look at it from anteriorly, be able to see, you, uh, you'll be able to see the aqueduct, the posterior commissure, the pineal recess, uh, and the suprapineal recesses. So be very, very uh, conversant with this anatomy from both the front and the back and knowing what structures there are. And then when going below, uh, uh, opening up the third ventricle, for example, during a, and, uh, through the ventriculostomy, recognize that there are membranes and these are the membranes of liliquist, both the diencephalic and the mesencephalic leaves of this. And below this lie your uh, oculomotor nerve. If you're a little too lateral from about 11 o'clock, on, on one side and one o'clock on the other side, you may be able to get in and injure the, uh, the third nerve. Know that the left posterior cerebral artery is just very near where you are operating. Then there are, as I mentioned, the uh, liliquous membranes, both mesencephalic and the diencephalic, which then uh, need to be opened. And one then knows that there is the basilar artery and the, the cerebral arch, posterior cerebral arteries, the superior cerebral arteries are all in that vicinity. So recognizing this anatomy is crucial for doing a successful uh, procedure in this. Uh, we'll, again, this is another view showing the various structures that one must become very conversant with and know that they are in 
in regions of harm if one is not careful. Going further down, you can then visualize the foramen uh, magnum, you see the medulla, you can then see the uh, vertebral artery, you'll see the pica, uh, you see the hypoglossal nerves, the 11th nerve, all anatomical structures that must become very, very familiar if you're going to be operating in these regions, uh, uh, treating hydrocephalus. So uh, management of hydrocephalus is, is diverse and one must recognize the variants of anatomy that exists in this, these patients. Sometimes you, one finds no septum, sorry, one finds no septum, no, no corpus callosum, enlarged phonesial columns, interthalamic commissures, floating choroid plexuses. Sometimes there's just no floor of the third ventricle and you're straight into the, uh, uh, into the, uh, basal systems. Uh, the success of treatment has been very well covered by colleagues. The uh, ETV success score, depending on factors such as age, uh, etiology, infections are uh, a, a really a problem uh, for success of ETV. And the good candidates are those that have got aqueductal stenosis. So you can score points on these in order to define and tell the parents how effective your ETV is going to be. Has the child had a... You're uh, less likely to have a successful ETV. Um, and these scores go from zero to 90. And that is essentially equates to the percentage chance that that ETV is likely to succeed uh, for that particular child. So the message is that we can uh, gauge the possibility of success and it's helpful in providing an informed guidance to parents by the care provider. Uh, this is just to illustrate the case of a three-year-old girl with hydrocephalus with severely delayed milestones diagnosed before sending to us as a dandy walker malformation. And when you look at it, essentially it, it isn't a dandy walker malformation see, it's causing obstructed hydrocephalus. And uh, really the question that was posed to the initial uh, team was, should we shunt or not to shunt? Um, they opted uh, to shunt. And unfortunately the shunt went into uh, causing problems. It had the bowel perforation, came out through the dis uh, anus, the distal catheter got replaced. This was followed by meningitis, with ventriculitis, which was treated with antibiotics. A second proximal suboccipital catheter was placed into the suspected Dendy Walker cyst. There was a short lived improvement followed by gradual deterioration. And then one was. Minute, uh, Modi. How many minutes? One more. Okay. So then we'll just head off basically was referred for ETV. And uh, what was then found was this the large arachnoid cyst, uh, which was actually pressing against the third ventricle and pressing the aqueduct and causing the hydrocephalus. And we'll run through this, pressing the cerebellum right down and uh, against uh, the brainstem and you really don't want to do an ETV because you have the risk of the circle of unhappiness. This is where the shunt uh, that had previously been placed was done. And we then decided to approach it from uh, microsurgically to open uh, the arachnoid through cyst fenestration. And really just very quickly, we'll run through this. Uh, and then putting the endoscope, recognizing that there's the vein of Galen, there's the basal, basal veins of Rosenthal, there are the internal cerebral veins, and essentially carrying out a, a microsurgical opening into the third ventricle. And essentially that was the young girl on the third post-operative day 
uh, opening with an MRI showing the opening into the third ventricle and the opening of the aqueduct now. And the fourth ventricle was opening on 14 today. The, the <clears throat> aqueduct had opened mo more. Uh, the cerebellum was now beginning to open up and the fourth ventricle was also opening up. So essentially the message is, as in any surgical endeavor, understanding the surgical anatomy is the key imperative to recognize the underlying etiology and selecting the most important or appropriate surgical procedure best suited to that particular problem. With that, I thank you very much. And Professor Sami, I thank you for giving us all you have given us in East Africa. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, um, Moody. Thanks. Uh, that's a great talk. Um, the overview of the situation in Africa. And also, as you said, the anatomy is the guide wherever you work, whichever country you work. And as you correctly said, irrespective of whether what info infrastructure you have, is, if you depend on the anatomy, that will be your guide. Thank you. I think we, we have um, we have uh, any questions on this chat. We'll, can, can, please have a look, uh, Moody. And uh, go on to the next uh, speaker um, who's been introduced by Prof. Imad Kanan before, Prof. Mario. I'm Ranti from US. Uh, it's going to talk on the um, importance of arachnoid membrane in skull base surgery. Uh, Prof. Uh, I'm Ranti, please um, um, share your screen. Thank you. So my, uh, my talk will uh, revolve around the importance of the arachnoid membrane in skull bed surgery. Um, I spent quite a few, a few years in Hanover with uh, Professor Sami. And uh, of course, I, I learned many things from him. But I think one of the most important things that I learned was uh, the way in which he was treating the arachnoid, um, the arachnoid uh, membrane. And uh, um, as, uh, as it relates to skull bed surgery, it is very important to, to be cognizant of the fact that skull base uh, uh, tumors, benign skull base tumors, they really behave in two substantially different ways regarding the arachnoid membrane. And this is a slide that has been taken from uh, uh, Yazagi operative neurosurgery. You can see in the upper portion, you can see a, 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 a schwannoma or a meningioma. Schwannoma or meningioma, they are usually covered by their own arachnoid membrane, but then they are separated from the other system by a more or less developed arachnoidal membrane. And uh, what is the surgical importance of that? The surgical importance of that is tremendous because if you, if you preserve the interface between the tumor and uh, the arachnoid membrane of the surrounding cistern, and you do not enter them as much as you can, then that's the best way to protect the neurovascular structure that are present in this other cistern. And that applies no matter if you are operating on a posterior fossa vestibular schwannoma or a, or a medial sphenoid wing or any other type of tumor. On the other end, there are, there are other tumors like craniopharyngioma, for example, or epidermoid, that they, are, that they develop inside the arachnoid, uh, inside the arachnoid membrane. So, so really there is no arachnoid membrane that separates these other tumors from the surrounding structure. So that's why surgery of craniopharyngioma is uh, objectively much more difficult uh, than surgery of, uh, uh, of meningioma or vestibular schwannoma, because the craniopharyngioma is a tumor that grows in, in uh, the sub -peel, in the sub -peel space. And uh, therefore, when we try to peel the tumor from uh, the surrounding brain, it's very difficult. And sometimes we see beautiful pictures of the inside of the third ventricle and all the structures that are inside the third ventricles. We can see all the way to the, 
to the A1, the A2, and what's not. But what we sometimes forget is that in order for us to have this beautiful view, we must go through a very important structure that is uh, the floor of the third ventricle, that is the diencephalon, the hypothalamus. And that's why many times after we have a beautiful intraoperative picture and a complete removal of a kind of an endoma, nevertheless, the patient is left with significant and devastating uh, long-term neurological problems. So it's very important, and that's what I learned from uh, working in Hanover for two years with Professor Sami, it's very important to be, uh, to be aware of the fundamentals of neurosurgery. The fundamentals of neurosurgery, as well as the fundamentals of any other human endeavor, they represent the building block, uh, the building material, uh, on which a science, a discipline is built. And you can really, it's very difficult to be proficient in any human endeavor unless, unless you master the fundamental. Uh, you may, of course, you know, there are uh, several examples in, uh, in uh, human endeavors of people who have transcended the, the uh, fundamental. For example, you know, Picasso, he developed uh, a way of painting that clearly went well above the fundamentals. But many people forget that Picasso was also a masterful, a masterful uh, uh, artist in a traditional way. So he had mastered the fundamentals in order to go above them. So what are the fundamentals in, uh, in skull bed surgery? I think, as I said before, one of the most important thing is that of respecting the arachnoidal plane. Because if you respect the arachnoidal plane, you put yourself in a good position to stay away from complication by avoid entering a surrounding system that contain important neurovascular structure. Uh, you need to limit coagulation. That was another thing that I learned from, uh, um, from Professor Sami, and that was really a little bit contrary to what I had been taught during my training in the United States. Limit coagulation is very important because if you coagulate, especially at the interface between a benign skull based tumor and the surrounding arachnoid, you are going to coalesce the arachnoid. And so that will make it very difficult to separate the tumor from the surrounding arachnoid. And that makes very easy entrance into surrounding arachnoidal system with potential uh, complication. Then you got to be able to approach tumor from different angles, because we all know that what is not possible to accomplish from a certain angle during, its, during a certain phase of the operation may be very well accomplished from a different angle. So you must have an opening, uh, an opening and an exposure of the lesion that allows you to, to really perform a multi-angled exposure. And uh, although the trend today is to use uh, uh, very small approaches and very small opening, and you know that's all well and nice, but I think it's very important to maintain the concept of a multi-angled approach because that really is extremely helpful in a skull bed surgery. Then, as has been said before by many other speakers, Professor Turell and others, you must have a clear surgical plane, a clear goal that, of course, needs to be shared preoperatively uh, with the patient. But you must also be prepared to, to change your plane. You may do all the advanced planning, but nothing can prepare you 100% to what you will see at surgery. It's just like if you go into battle, you can do all the, all the preparation, but there is nothing that really replace what you see during, during the battle. And, and you must be able to adapt if you want to be successful and if you want to win. And then you must be aware of other modalities to control tumors, like for example, radio surgery, because uh, that's really may impact on your decision-making during surgery. And having said that, I am just going to show you 
a short video in which I think many of these concepts will be highlighted. This is a young lady with quite a large uh, vestibular schwannoma. Of course, she presented with problem with equilibrium and uh, of course she had lost her uh, hearing. And you can see the very large uh, vestibular schwannoma. We approached this tumor just following Professor Sami teaching, uh, doing a, a retrosigmoid craniotomy with the patient in the semi-sitting position. And uh, the first step, the first step that we do is that of uh, opening uh, the inferior cerebellopontine system, the lateral cerebellomedullary system, and release CSF. And we also use retractor, and the retractor is not a swear word in micro, in micro neurosurgery or in uh, surgery of skull based tumor, provided that you know how to use them. So we release CSF before even opening completely the dura, and that allows us to. Uh, to be able to expose the cerebellopontine angle uh, in a very efficient way and in a very automatic way. And uh, you can see here, a retractor has been placed on the cerebella hemisphere and we are, uh, we are peeling the arachnoid membrane of, uh, that covers the tumor. We are peeling it from, uh, uh, from the tumor per se. And uh, you can see here that once we have done this peeling, then we use a, the, the CUSA to aggressively and quickly remove these, uh, you know, these vestibular schwannoma performing this intracapsular removal, but intracapsular staying outside the arachnoid that, uh, that really uh, represents a barrier between the tumor and the other neurovascular structures that are contained in the other, uh, in the other, uh, in the other surrounding system, and of course, when you operate on the vestibular schwannoma, you are dealing with, uh, uh, you know, the system uh, covering the brain stem, and as soon as we see an arachnoidal plane, we we are able to uh, to really stabilize it. We usually place a small uh, cotonoid in order to uh, delineate our uh, our approach and to make sure that we preserve the integrity of the other arachnoidal structure. And again, you can see here, and that's also another maneuver that I learned from Professor Sami, that of, uh, of really grasping the arachnoid with very simple instrument, a bayonet instrument, and, uh, and then separating it from uh, the tumor. And as you can see here, we coagulate very little, we coagulate very little, and that's due to the fact that we um, use the semi-sitting position. So clearly the annoying bleeding that uh, comes from the tumor, uh, it goes away from us. So that allow, allows us to limit the coagulation. And by limiting the coagulation, we prevent, prevent the coalescence of the tumor and arachnoid at the interface between the tumor and the arachnoid. And uh, you can see that we keep, uh, keep uh, performing, uh, you know, the same, uh, the same maneuver on uh, the tumor, separating the arachnoid, identifying other system, and uh, uh, securing the space using cotonoid, and then uh, going on and uh, keeping removing uh, this very large tumor. And you can see the, the cranial nerves being evident, and uh, very, 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 very gently, we are able to separate the tumor from, uh, from the seventh and the eighth, the eighth was already done from a, from a practical point of view. Here we are removing the tumor from uh, the internal auditory canal. In this large tumor, we sometimes do it at the end of, uh, or toward the end of the procedure. And then we are very careful because as we all know, the maximum adherence between the tumor and the facial nerve is a couple of millimeter uh, distal to the internal auditory canal. So we must be very careful at that stage, but still we can see that we are able to, uh, to, to really clearly separate the tumor from the facial nerve and we have uh, debulked this tumor significantly. So we have transformed the large giant vestibular schwannoma into a small vestibular schwannoma and we have never entered any of the system that surround uh, the tumor. 
So at the end, we have a good resection of this tumor, a complete resection of this tumor. You can see that really there is no evidence of any, of any retraction damage. And uh, when we sometimes hear retraction damage, I mean, we, we, we need to wonder why there is retraction damage because retraction is very easy if you know and very helpful if you know how to use it. And uh, at the end of this, uh, you know, first lengthy procedure, we were very satisfied because the patient that uh, she a couple of weeks after surgery was doing very well and she has a beautiful smile. And that really makes all the effort that we made during the surgery uh, worthwhile. So um, essentially what we wanna say and we want to emphasize is that if you respect the arachnoidal plane in benign extraaxial tumor, you are in a good place because you do not enter surrounding system with surrounding important neurovascular structure. You need to limit the coagulation. That's very important. In a, in a patient with posterior fossa tumor, you can limit the coagulation if you use the semi-sitting position. Uh, I, when I came back from uh, Germany and I started to do case in the semi-sitting position, I, I had to do a lot of teaching and uh, convincing regarding my anesthesiologist colleagues because they were not used to do that for, uh, we don't need to go into all the potential complication of semi-sitting and the perception of that. I think Professor Tatajiba has written extensively on uh, how to mitigate and has demonstrated that we all know that the semi-sitting position were properly executed, it's very safe. Uh, you must approach the tumor from different angles. So multi-angled exposure, it's, it's, it's fundamental. It's one of the fundamental of skull base surgery together with respect of the arachnoidal plane and limit of the coagulation. You must have a clear surgical plane, but you must be able to recognize the signal that the tumor gives to you during surgery and you must be prepared to change your claim. And you must be aware of other modalities to control tumor, such as radio surgery. And you know, radio surgery, uh, it's not only single fraction radio surgery, but radio surgery is also multiple fraction, up to five fraction uh, stereotactic radio surgery that is very effective in controlling uh, benign skull based tumor when it is necessary. So the conclusion are that if microneurosurgical fundamental, uh, fundamentals are properly mastered and used and the importance of the arachnoid membrane is recognized, then the majority of skull-based tumors may be safely operated using simple surgical approaches. And uh, I think that was, uh, that was uh, my message. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that's been a great, that was a great talk and uh, such a crucial um, aspect of microneurosurgery. And I, uh, I think we have time to have two comments or questions uh, from the panelists. Um, anyone wants to make a comment? Okay, um, so if you do have any questions from the audience watching it, please do send in your questions so uh, Prof. Amrati can answer on the question and answer chat box. Uh, if there's no other comment, um, I would like to go to uh, Prof. Lucas Rasulik. I can see his um, face on the screen now. Are you ready with your talk, uh, Lucas? Yes, yes, uh, coming in a minute. Excellent. So, Prof. Uh, Lucas Raslik, we have introduced you already. Prof. Imad Kanan has introduced you already. Um, you are Professor of um, uh, New Surgery in uh, University of Belgrade and you are hosting the uh, next ANS 2022. You are the President of the Serbian Neurosurgical Society. So, great to have you here, uh, Lucas, and uh, we look forward to your talk. And we have 15 minutes and 5 minutes for discussion. Uh, good afternoon, everybody from Venice. I'm actually on the ANS training course in uh, Venice and I will give you my talk. I can hear you uh, well. I hope you can hear me and it's my great pleasure to give a lecture on this outstanding occasion, uh, celebrating uh, life achievement of Professor Sami, who is our teacher and mentor. My talk will be top 10 children's in peripheral neurosurgery in 21st century. Uh, 
Hondring Lyman, it's been my great pleasure to be among the giants of neurosurgery uh, present here today. I congratulate uh, Professor Imad Kanan and uh, Vlad Benesh for organizing this event. And this is um, one of my uh, most important uh, moments in my life, uh, meeting and uh, gathering together, joining uh, to Professor Sami group and learning from Professor Sami uh, what I have learned in a developing a state of mind of neurosurgery. So mission, Majid Sami, mission, achievement, devotion, journey, inspiration, depth, sophistication, advancement, merit, innovation, instruction was an acronym of uh, uh, Professor Sami's name, uh, which was um, dedicated to the uh, anniversary Congress in uh, Montenegro, which you remember all very well. And uh, thank you all for coming there. Uh, regarding brachial plexus and peripheral neurosurgery through the time, Professor Majid Sami is one of the pioneers in uh, every field of neurosurgery, including this one. And uh, first of his uh, uh, scientific papers and works are related to the peripheral neurosurgery and we all learn from, from them. So if nerves are regenerating, repair is possible, why results are not better? because regeneration is slow, suffered and hazard, all nerve injuries are chronic and reinnervation is misdirected, non-specific and imprecise. In uh, three years, uh, 60 to 90% uh, success uh, after surgery uh, remains a useful functional recovery and this is important for the quality of life of our patient. Multidisciplinary approach and treatment of this patient are uh, very important uh, with communication, collaboration and interaction in this and so I will present you, in my opinion, top 10 children in 21st century peripheral neurosurgery in my personal perspectives. Late spontaneous recovery, late reintervention after the surgery and uh, going through the, the age. So despite advances in surgical techniques for peripheral nerve repair, functional restitution remains incomplete, especially when you have a cases when you can have a late spontaneous recovery due to the bi biological challenges and the late renovation after surgery. And what about the patients who are, for example, uh, more than 60, 70 and above years old should be repaired the patient uh, in terms of uh, giving him a possibility to have a nerve regeneration following nerve repair. Uh, uh, Decision-making processes are very important. Uh, uh, surgical treatment strategies also so uh, we are still lacking the class one evidence based on preoperative evaluation and uh, based, we are still lean on coin flip based decision making as a matter of interoperative finding and surgical experience in uh, these uh, circumstances. So international multicentric double blind randomized cohort studies are important in this, in this uh, case and more recommendations data, data are needed for every single nerve injury, although none of, none of the nerves will recover the same and the uh, uh, case-based approach is mandatory. Facial animation is another very important challenge and uh, very well known hypoglossal facial nerve transfer is uh, one of the standard techniques with transfer modification, but this is uh, uh, what I want to emphasize here is this Professor Sami's technique in the reconstructive procedures of, procedures of the facial nerve in the cerebral pontin angle and uh, also including extracranial reconstructive procedures uh, for the facial nerve, which is uh, his, uh, uh, Professor Sami's uh, great contribution to the, this field of the, of the neurosurgery. Another challenge is vocal fold paralysis. Can we treat the vocal fold paralysis with the renovation of the recurrent laryngeal nerve as it is the most frequent cause of uh, the vocal fold paralysis in cases of trauma? So we can uh, uh, obtain uh, effective renovation using ANSA cervical is to the renovate the re uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. <clears throat> as well, another very challenging uh, issue is uh, a reconstructive uh, peripheral nerve surgery in cases with keratopathy. And uh, you, we can uh, perform contralateral supraorbital and supratrochlear nerve transfer and with the useful functional results. Another issue is uh, frozen sections. Uh, should we perform interoperative extemporary histology of the proximal, proximal stump in uh, terms of uh, uh, confirming uh, viability of the proximal stump? Since uh, according to the literature, 6% of stumps uh, 
uh, require, according to the neuropathologist, re resection. And uh, this is something which uh, is also based on uh, experience of the surgeon, since in uh, many centers uh, you don't have possibility to uh, perform um, interoperative uh, histology for the proximal stump. Brachial plexus reconstruction is a uh, permanent challenge, and since from uh, this historical drawing from Sharon in 1906, 1906 uh, with possibility for nerve transfers. There are nerve transfers with uh, some failures uh, because of the surgeon. Training is mandatory and the technique uh, is a uh, uh, matter of uh, continuous work. Uh, indication is also very important and the age of the patient is very important in order to uh, make a adequate uh, decision. Current reconstruction protocol are very well known in uh, C5, C6 uh, medullary evulsion lesions in complete brachial plexus palsy. Uh, in complete brachial plexus palsy, there is a still uh, open issue usage of viable C5 and C6 use, which can be very useful for the patient, especially if the C5 route is viable. And um, also usage of dorsal scapular nerve, which can be additional neurotizer in order to re uh, branch of the lateral help for the triceps nerve in these circumstances when the C5 root is viable in cases with complete brachial plexus palsy. So there's a scapular nerve to the branch of the lateral head of the triceps uh, with distal nerve transfers might be a useful uh, procedure for uh, this patient. So conclusion one in this, uh, the cases with brachial plexus uh, lesions uh, don't make the patient worse. And um, spinal axillary nerve use is uh, harvesting the spinal axillary nerve with fusion of the shoulder, one of the possibility to, to help the patient. Additional possibilities, phrenic nerve transfer is the functional sacrifice acceptable for the patients with complete brachial plexus palsy since the phrenic nerve is of is outstanding uh, extra potential donor with motor fibers. Uh, there are new attempts in terms of renovation of the very early reconstruction of the ulnar nerve with branches of the axillary nerve to the ulnar nerve through the routine axillary approach and very uh, direct cooptation with uh, some nice results, but this is still uh, a controversial issue. Another challenge is hand renovation. Bionic hand uh, for elective amputation patient is a, a solution still in progress. And this is something when cases with we, which are inoperable in any manner. And some, for example, cases like this one, when you have uh, amputations and you should use, uh, for example, uh, modular prosthetic limbs. This is a very difficult problem. Another challenge is uh, anterior cutaneous nerve and trapez syndrome. First of all, does it exist or not exist? Because 30% uh, of chronic abdominal pain is uh, due to the pain in the abdominal wall. Is this uh, really regarding this anterior cutaneous uh, uh, nerve and trapez syndrome or not? And neurolysis is it can be useful. Additional problem is, um, additional challenge is malignant alteration which is multi-step genetic changes uh, in the time, malignant alteration of the tumors of the peripheral nerve lesions. Uh, for example, leomyosarcoma grade three is a case which requires uh, medical treatment, clinical trial, and then uh, through national registry evaluation about this case, is this for surgery or not, and how we can help this patient in uh, terms of uh, treatment. So surgery in this uh, uh, malignant cases should be reserved for very exceptionally serious cases. Another challenge is uh, pain with uh, symptom with uh, syndrome very well known as myalgia parasthetica, which is uh, let's say uh, controversial also, and uh, very difficult to first to evaluate and then to treat. And uh, surgery is uh, also. Uh, matter of uh, question. Another problem is another intractable pain with uh, different treatment options, which can be augmentative and uh, ablative. So we have augmentative procedures on your, on our, in our armamentarium, such as drezotomy, uh, and then the ablative procedures such as 
dresotomy. Then we have a, uh, another entity such as pudendal nerve neuralgia, which is also a uh, syndrome for potential surgical treatment. Then cluminal nerve neuralgia, which is also another cause of the pain. And then finally, last challenge is uh, augmentation of nerve regeneration, uh, which is uh, now very developing in this field uh, using, for example, olfactory and sheeting cells, then stem cells, gene therapy, and uh, phototherapy, as well as electrical stimulation. And uh, of course, diet, nutrition, and supplementation uh, is uh, uh, in this field. So uh, still current standing in this field is KISS or keep it simple surgeon within the neurolysis, direct future cases, nerve grafting cases, uh, interfascicular grafting cases, and uh, cable grafting cases, modified cable grafting cases. These are nerve repair solution with uh, artificial uh, conduits. Uh, which can be used also in uh, in uh, reconstructive surgery of the peripheral nerves, especially with a diameter less than 10 millimeters and uh, uh, small nerve gaps, uh, let's say uh, around one centimeter, especially for digital nerve. For example, another issue is suture or non-suture anastomosis techniques. When you put the cooptation without tension, you can uh, even uh, stabilize this uh, Cooptation only using fibrin glue, like uh, Professor Sami is uh, uh, doing in his, his cases. And you can do both. You can do microsurgical suturing and the combination with fibrin glue. There are some uh, different kind of nerve transfers, which are, uh, let's say, very contro controversial. Should we help the patient with intercostal nerve transfer, or we can take uh, another, another issue, such as phrenic nerve transfer. There are accessorial to suprascapular nerve transfer via anterior approach, nerve grafting in plexus cases, then usage of the regional nerve transfer, such as uh, pectoral, medial, and toracodosal nerve, then uh, SOMSA procedure, overlimb procedure, double fascicular nerve transfer. This is a SOMSA procedure again. So these are cases uh, which are very, very, uh, let's say, uh, very useful to do it because it really helps the patient. Uh, innovations such as robotic bionic reconstruction, cloud database, and artificial intelligence are uh, also in our armamentorium. And you can see some cases uh, operated by robotic surgery, plexus cases uh, performed Oberlin procedure using Da Vinci uh, robot in a Brazilian group of uh, neurosurgeons who are doing peripheral nerve surgery, as well as the SOMSA procedure with the Vinci S robot. With they report nice outcome uh, in uh, limited series, but generally outcome was correct. So the patience is important, and most neurosurgeons are not satisfied with the weight of the results. It may take up to one to two years to see the results of your work and quality of life, and the outcome assessment is beyond the useful functional recovery. So this is also a matter of further investigation. Outcome assessment is uh, mandatory with a uh, uh, question, is the modified MRC system appropriate? Is M3 really satisfactory functional outcome of this patient? And should the range of motion testing uh, be another uh, test for evaluation of the quality of life of the patient? Instead of conclusion, education and, uh, and transdisciplinarity is mandatory in uh, uh, future perspectives of this field. Brain plasticity and quantum and quantum phenomena are very well known in terms of when you're cutting your nerve, you change your brain. And um, neurosurgeon in perspective is a multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary surgeon who is doing this. And this question is the peripheral nerve surgery as important as clipping an aneurysm or resecting a brain tumor or uh, performing the breath spine stability. Uh, question, uh, the answer on this question is yes. So some of the nice uh, moments from our gatherings uh, through the time before this pandemic, which I hope uh, it will uh, reanimate very soon. These are some of the educational events which we performed in uh, regarding peripheral nerve surgery following Professor Sami's 
uh, instructions. And a uh, nice group of people are is, is doing things. So current standing in this field is that hands-on courses on site training with the financial support of the foundation and the continental national societies and web-based activities should build up a bridge between countries with more and countries with less resources. Factors that influence treatment are very well known and uh, oh, okay. perspectives are, are uh, uh, in publication and publications, the research. We also need to help our colleagues to publish and to uh, obtain them to uh, not to be discouraged because of the steep learning curve in this field, because this is our functional final goal, which is functional recovery. So what will the future like? Karl Heinz Land, my very close friend, uh, friend uh, wrote this book, uh, Earth 5.0, to provoke the future. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, who will perform the suture, surgery in future, uh, man or machine? I still believe that uh, this field of surgery will be in the uh, hand of uh, surgeons in, uh, in the future. So for one who has nothing, a little is a lot. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I would cordially like to invite you. You already received the invitation. And thank you for all who accept the invitation for our seventh annual meeting of Serbian Neurosurgical Society with international participation, which will be held in online environment in November. And hopefully uh, next year in uh, 2022 in uh, Belgrade, we will finally uh, gather together in organizing uh, ENS 2022 instead of ENS 2020 European Congress of Neurosurgery. So thank you very much for your attention. It was my great pleasure and honor and privilege to give this talk today. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great talk. We have two minutes um, to have a comment or question. Um, okay, Prof. Sami, you can unmute and then could you unmute? Uh, you're not mute. You're not on. Okay, good. Can you hear me? Yes. I would like, uh, because uh, Professor Rasulic is uh, talking on peripheral nerve, I would like uh, uh, to thank him and all uh, people I have educated in peripheral nerve surgery around the world that they have taken this field seriously over and tried to further develop the peripheral nerve. I must tell you that still today, I enjoy so much to operate a brachial plexus or facial nerve reconstruction with all possibilities and peripheral. At that time, as I was a young resident, the peripheral nerve surgery in neurosurgery was given to the just resident and assistant try to do it. And uh, as we started then to do this, I will talk on that in my presentation. And I have tried to motivate my colleagues around the world to learn the peripheral nerve and, and then try also to keep for neurosurgery because the plastic surgeon and orthopedic surgeons, of course, they were interested in that field and took over majority in many countries, this field. And therefore, I take the opportunity to thank uh, uh, Lucas, thank you that you have uh, dedicated yourself for this field and trying ev everything to organize courses and educate other young people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Um, any other comments before we? I ask uh, Prof. Matthias Baltocini to moderate the next session. Okay, um, so uh, Prof. Uh, Baduccini, could you start the next? Yes. Session? Yes, Ramesh. Thanks. Okay, continuing with the um, the second part of of the lectures of uh, today, uh, Professor Ahmad Kanan uh, is our chairman of the WFNS Neuroanatomy Committee and Professor and Chairman Emeritus of the KFSH and Research Center of Alpha Psi University. Professor Aymal Kanan um, is the next speaker with the title Transformation for Signature to Tailored Skull-Based Approach. 
go ahead, Professor Canan. And and I can thanks. share my, thank you. May I share my screen? No, no yet. Yes. You we see my screen, serve. can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Well, it's my pleasure to give that talk so, uh, while we are celebrating and honoring our uh, colleague and legendary professor Majid Sami. Uh, the topics I selected, inspiration and innovation, and the Majid Sami School of Neurosurgery. He is the, in my book, and I like to take that uh, nomination, the Da Vinci of contemporary neurosurgery. He has worked art with science and he has selected simplicity with efficiency and adopted innovation with safety. These are the motto of this meeting. So if we see these uh, approaches, we move from perional and subfrontal down to uh, frontobasal and uh, frontoorbitozygomatic and in the posterior fossa, we went from the retromastoid to a co more complex, the Kawazi approach to anterior petrosal, posterior petrosal combination, like in Hakuba approach and Rifti approach. And over the past years, we start, start coming back to the original, to the power horse approaches, which are the frontal anterior approach in the anterior fossa, middle fossa, and the retro mastoid or retrosigmoid approach for most of the cases in the posterior fossa. And of course, we were complemented with the help of endoscopy as a tool to enhance our exposure. The, the most important message I have been always trying to pass it to both generation and microscopic surgeon and uh, people claim they are endoscopic surgeon. There is one important skills that the both masters, uh, Professor Majid Sami and Professor Yazavji has uh, stressed is the perfection of microsurgical technique. Whether you are doing endoscopy and or microscopy, you have to perform a good microsurgical dissection. These are the evolution we have uh, adopted over the past uh, 50 years. And uh, they are the predecessors in the transfernal surgery. They all have their contribution from Schloffer up to Julius Hardy. So you added the microscope. And credit should be given to Boswell Griffith from Bristol in 1987. He was the one who designed the direct approach, which is really a minimally invasive approach to pituitary fossa. Of course, endoscopy came later. And this has opened the door widely. Uh, people talk about the extended approach. I call it the endoscopic assisted approach to transfer that. And the indication for this approach becomes larger, like large supracellular lesion with a small cell, a dumbbell shaped tumor, adenoma, a retrocellular expansion. And I will give some ex examples of this situation. I divide the pituitary tumor in four stages, the uh, nasal cavity, the sinus, the, the cella, and the supraparacella region. And I feel in most of these cases, we are still able to do the microsurgical approach to these cases, to answer the direct approach by Dr. Griffith. And we use the endoscopy mainly in phase uh, three and four, where we need to see beyond the a view of the endoscopy. And that's what we do. There is no harm by using the speculum. You have an easy access, a midline, for sure you go midline. You don't go through the ostium lateralized, and then you get sometimes lost, especially in the recurrent tumors, where you have the midline and the, this approach that has been designed for many years and adapted for many years. At the time where I reach an area, I need the endoscope like the medial cavernous sinus, uh, infra, uh, diaphragmatic, or an extended tumor going up and lateral supracellular. This is where I need the endoscope. And here it shows nicely that I can see the medial wall of the, caverna, the carotid arc or the cavernous signs. 
Of course, navigation has helped us tremendously, and especially in the recurrent cases and in uh, giant tumors. All these tumors I'm going to show, they were done unilateral nostril, and we assessed them with the endoscopy to visualize any residual, and we followed the concept, I call it the clockwise removal of the tumors, starting from the lower and then start from both sides, right and left, to reach the dome of it, so we can get that space, that space to bring that tumor down. This is a tumor, very giant. This was taken by a binostral approach using the endoscopy, but not the extended approach. I call it the endoscopic assisted approach. And you see here a nice resection of this tumor without any consequences. Uh, this is another one. It's always thought that there is some stenosis in the center of this tumor by the vessel, but it went fine. And it, again, binostral approach, uh, taking a giant tumor with endoscopic uh, assisted. Uh, there are several examples, and these are the values I mentioned. Endoscope, if it's within the cell line, Cushing disease, for example, you can uh, visualize better the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, subdiaphragmatic area, and peripituitary stroke area to identify any microadenoma. The list goes further with the endoscopic uh, assisted approach. Not only pituitary tumor, there are some rat cases and some cystic craniopharyngioma that we have taken nicely out, but avoid and beware of the calcified craniopharyngioma that can cause you a trouble and cause the patient a major morbidity. This part I don't like, and I show one case that I have to operate on somebody who was op operated transferred on a calcified tumor in France, and he came back with a major recurrence and I show you the images of that one. Uh, epidermoids, and we have chordomas. There are some cases of subdiaphragmatic meningioma. Actually, this is almost in the nose, uh, can be benefit from that approach. This is a case, we thought it's a pituitary adenoma, uh, the line of the direction of the uh, growth, but it tends to be a craniopharyngioma. And this was taken by a, uh, endoscopic assisted transvenous surgery, but it's mainly cystic with some uh, leveling, as you see on this picture. There are two level, fluid level. This case, to tell you the truth, I th we thought first it's a chordoma, and we said it's a purely midline, let's do the MRA, and it shows that the basal artery is completely displaced to the other side. See, the midline is almost vacant. So we elected to go transfer there is just uh, retroclival and uh, retro sinus. And it tends to be a meningioma. Once we coagulate the dura and open it, that meningioma was very soft and it offered itself to remove. So I'm not going to close and say I will leave it. I debulk it, but I managed to take this one in complete. This is a pre and this is post-op with a nice uh, approach. You see the brain stem back to its position without any consequence, and patient could be discharged after four days. Uh, this is the case of chordoma. Again, purely midline. See what's happened to the basal artery. The patient was very hesitant to have a complex approach. Uh, we were in the past going into uh, the pre-sigma or the far lateral approach to take this tumor and drill the last bit of bone to avoid recurrence. Yet people, they got their recurrence even with the removing most of the bone visualized on the images. This case went in by extended approach and you see pre and post the brain stem we expand and laser RT in position and patient was sent to potent beam treatment. Let's go to another area, which is the frontal uh, lateral uh, lesion. Are we still like the simple terminal approach? I know Professor Sammy like the subfrontal. I feel both of them, they are almost kin. You just shift yourself to a little bit to the frontal area. You are more subfrontal. You go back a little bit in the subtemporal and the temporal. And Therion is the epicenter of the area to go down. And I still like the drilling of the sphenoid wing. It takes that bone balcony away from your view. And you are very near to any lesion in that area. And most of the time I go for the non-dominant. We apply the rules of the arachnoid that my friend uh, Mario mentioned about this patty 
the this uh, arachnoid is your natural patty, I call it, and it's belong to the patient. Leave it alone, so you can protect the vessels and the cranial nerve. Drilling of the uh, uh, optic uh, canal or the roofing the canal is sometimes very important. It has very values, especially in the tuberculum cell tumor where they have tumor tongue going in both foramina. And amazing, if you, some people say you can manage without the drilling, yes, but you manipulate the optic nerve that is tethered and sometimes extremely displaced superiorly. And that manipulation can lead to some ischemic changes on the optic. So decompressing the optic, it takes five minutes in good hands and you can manipulate and take any tumor residual from that area. These are tumors taken from uh, in a simple perioneal approach, pre and post. Now I want to show this case because I'd like to add the value of endoscopy. Professor Sami, I remember many years ago, somebody asking him, oh, you are not using the endoscope. He said, the endoscope is a tool. I have it open in the room whenever I need it to visualize, I'll use it. And I adapted this idea from Professor Sami. And now when I take a tumor out, of course, we use the dup level if you are going for a unilateral approach. You see, this case, we thought we took everything out. This is the optic nerve. This is the carotid on the contralateral side. This is posterior clinoid, and this is the third nerve. But when I look to the stalk, there was a small tissue behind it that I could not see into the microscope. So it will be disappointing after the images, you see that residual. Uh, hanging around in the images. So we took it by the help of the endoscopy visualization. So another case, this is the case of the craniopharyngioma I mentioned, the bed in France, uh, left a uh, major residual, patient came back in uh, six months and he has a refill of the cyst and of course the tumor is there with severe compression. See this picture, this is when I tried to go to the approach, we applied the arachnoid dissection, but that Calcification was attached to branches of the superior cerebellar artery and the posterior cerebellar artery uh, in, the, uh, in that area. And we took that one, disconnected it, and then we really looked within the cellar. This is the stalk. There's still calcification that we could retrieve. This is a pre, and this is post of uh, resection. So endoscopy is very helpful as an assistant. Let's go to the posterior fossa and the uh, retro uh, sigmoid uh, approach. We adapted some modification between the sitting position and the uh, lateral position. And this approach, I found it very helpful in my hand. And this, I use it frequently. It's almost semi-sitting position. We elevate the trunk and the head and we play with the table. If you have a good table that can be fractured in the middle, and can be tilted forward and backwards. It's a marvelous table that I don't have the headache of the anesthesia. Uh, some of them, they are acquainted with the sitting, will do sitting when I've needed, but I like this approach and I have done it in my cases and I get no problem with the blood collection or CSF collection. If you follow the microsurgical technique of Professor Sami and Professor Yazaji. And one approach I have liked very much published many years ago by almost, you see, it's almost nine years by Professor Samuels. Many in there are not talking about it. This is the supramiatal approach, sorry for the typo uh, mistake, and with inferior incision of the tent and hybrid use of endoscopy. He published it nine years ago. If people start talking about endoscopy, this is the time was rarely people using endoscopy for that area. And this is a fantastic approach, especially for meningioma. This case, we thought we need a combined approach. We were judging in the panel to go combined or not, anterior and posterior. Said, look, look to the veins, the sigmoid and lateral sinus. There is no place pre-sigmoid to go there. And I elected to use that approach of Professor Sami. We went in and you see the tumor pre and post resection fantastic outcome without any consequences. We don't even bother about the facial uh, vestibular component. Patient did very well. I would show one video on, uh, on 
uh, sorry, let me show you. This is a uh, meningioma, uh, very nice. I look to the CSF spaces. You see that position, it offer you what you want. This is open, even here, I didn't put yet the retractor. I start applying the rules of 5D for meningioma, devascularized from the 10. Now the best important, peeling the arachnoid. I use the two forceps technique from Professor Sammy's technique. I adapted in my most tumor cases. See, you peel the arachnoid and then you start decompressing with the CUSA. I will take, um, see, and I put the endoscope to see if there is anything else. I'm seeing the tumor, devascularize the tumor from the 10 down. Here the CUSA is decompressing the CUSA tumor. I like to not to use the CUSA near the capsule, especially if I'm doing a vestibular schwannoma. And if you do the central debulking and then you take a bulk or a thickness of the capsule to hold on and do the peeling of the double layer of the arachnoid. Irrigation is the name of the game in tumor surgery. Blood, heat, and traction are the enemy of the cranial nerves and the vessels. And all they are evident to the vessel that might lead not only for neural tissue damage, but to as well as vasospasm. So we try to avoid these three. No bipolar or minimal use, keep the arachnoid intact and take the tumor off the tissue, not the other way around. Let's see, lifting the tumor so I have a hold and can peel the arachnoid nicely. I just go, the tumor is taken out. And now you see, this is the tumor resection. You can see the uh, brain and nerve complex. And then you see the six nerves in the death, brain stem without any problem. And the vessels, they are all safe and intact. I'll move to the uh, next slide. Okay, we use that approach for the epidermoid. We apply the same endoscopic assisted, a fantastic tool, and we apply it in pineal vision tumor. Pineal vision tumor, I still believe nothing compete with the semi-sitting position from the area of uh, blood and CSF and the cerebellum comes down and it has advantage and disadvantage and most disadvantage where we have denounced by many uh, uh, good surgeons. And I think there, there is a teaching process for the anesthetist. And don't use the sitting, use the semi-sitting position. It's a better approach. I don't like, you see the legs here below the heart, it should be higher than like what uh, Dr. Tadajiba showed yesterday. Uh, I will show one video to show you the advantage of the endoscopy. You see, first we start, this is the view under the microscope. Now I put the endoscope very nicely. You see the tentative and again. Now we are in with the endoscope. The view you get is unbelievable. The, the massa intermedia, you can see the aqueduct, the furnace down, posterior commissure. You see the tumor edges. It's again viewed or even to both lateral ventricles. Choroid plexus. And I start taking this tumor slowly out. I use the correct like I'm doing a pituitary. It's a very good approach. Endoscopy is very helpful in pinea region because the tight space will be wide enough for you to use the endoscope. The only issue sometimes, 
I'm using here dynamic endoscopy, but it uh, might be good to have uh, the fixed endoscope, but you need a good fixation system. I go further to the next. So the classification of neurosurgical strategy, I called approaches, there are three types. One of them is authoritative approaches. You were brought up by this approach. You have impact from the people around you that this is the best approach and you become very attached to this approach. Adaptive approach, when you see an approach, you modify it to, your, to fit your quality of work and type of work. And innovative approach, when you come with the new things that they are left for the masters like Professor Sam. There are factors influence the approach selection, the inherent bias in the neurosurgical training, span of experience to change your mind over the years, surgeon preference, like what we heard about some uh, Professor Spencer, he doesn't like the sitting for his own reason, cost and logistic, practice trend, and the industrial driven practice, like what's happened sometimes with the endoscopy because it's more cost effective than the microscope for some area. I thank you very much and I conclude my talk. Thank you very much, Professor Ahmad Kanan. Beautiful lecture. Uh, I don't know if there is some question from the panelists or comments. Yeah, may I ask a question? Yes, sure. Imad, Jacques here, very nice presentation. Can you comment on your preference of endonasal versus transcranial for tuberculum meningioma? I don't know if I missed what you said or no. not. I am very clear about it. We have an approach that is very safe. And the Teriona approach, your, your uh, path to the work every day, and I feel this approach is give me safety to my patients. Now, why I don't like the other one? You might get a nice view from below. If it's under the diaphragm, I have no problem to go from down. But it's above. I'm concerned about the vessels. And there are many people have seen video. They use the traction method, like pulling and counter with the suction. This pulling and counter, it will initiate uh, some spasm on these vessels that they are very fragile. And I, even hypophysial vessels. And I've seen people, they have dissected that vessels by the endoscopy. I prefer, and the issue with CSF League, although there are a lot of progress positively, but I still believe it does not compete with the outcome of going from above. The other things, the extent of the resection, if you need to take more meninges from the skull base to avoid recurrence, you are safer and you don't need to expedite more bone removal from below. Uh, that's what I might take. I agree with you completely. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jacques Morkos for your comments and Comment. Professor Adi Malkanan. Uh, okay. Continuing with the, with the speakers, it's a huge pleasure to me as an Argentinian uh, neurosurgeon to present uh, Professor Armando Basso. Professor Armando Basso is Professor and Chairman Emeritus, Professor Emeritus of the University of Buenos Aires and uh, um, past president and honorary president of the WFNS and uh, uh, the, the title of the, the talk uh, of Professor Armando Basso is Microsurgery of Cranial Pharyngiomas, Special Experience. Thank you, Professor Basso, for sharing this morning with us. Thank you. Thank you, dear Andasini. Uh, I will share my... my uh, Oh, no, no, no. Second. Share my screen.
Can you see my, my, my yes. slides? Yes, Armando. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, my dear friend Imad and, and Vladimir for this opportunity, for this kind invitation to participate in this special, uh, you know, celebration of uh, Magic Summit uh, achievement. Now, 50 years ago, 50, 5 0, in, in a meeting, in, I have been, uh, can you hear me good? Is the sound is good? Okay. Yes, Armando, the sound is perfect. Thank you. Um, I had been invited to a Congress in the North part of Brazil, in Fortaleza. That was in 72, that's been almost 50 years ago. And uh, I had been invited to chair as a chairman uh, of, uh, of a session. And then, and then uh, I, I, I met a young, a German neurosurgeon, and his, uh, his presentation impressed me so much that from then, from then on, Maji, Maji Tsami and myself, we have shared, you know, an enormous, an enormous experience ar around the world in the last 50, 50 years that, of course, I cannot, uh, uh, not enough time to, to to, to share with you all that experience. But in summary, I have to say that Professor Sami, my, my dear friend Majid Sami, is a, is a tremendous and unbelievable neurosurgeon, neuros, as neurosurgeon and teacher. And his experience transmit around, around the world. But more than, more than that, uh, uh, Majid Sami, Professor Sami, is a is a, is a, an enormous human being because his gener generosity to, to to share his experience with with neurosurgeons of all over the world is really legendary, and of course this 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 man who is uh, who is preoccupied by first of all part by the patient. Fortunately, he is. He is protected by the fantastic, by, by his fantastic family, you know, Majid, uh, uh, Amir, Mimi, and uh, the grandchildren. So, of course, uh, it's an enormous pleasure for me to participate in this meeting. And here you can see uh, Professor Sami uh, participate, uh, organize a barbecue in Argentina, you know, uh, try to put in order the fantastic, as we all know, you know, Argentine, Argentine youth. So, came back to the cranioparyngiomas now. Cranioparyngiomas is uh, no, is an unfrequent pathology. So, in every in every institute, many people without enough experience, they they uh, the people uh, perform uh, cranioparyngioma surgery one or two cases in a year, no more than that, with, with, with luck. So my experience, I will, I will share with you my personal experience obtained in this institute, which is a cradle of neurosurgery in Argentina, a ophthalmological hospital in Santa Lucia, as a German university hospital, and the UMS Neurosurgery, Neuroscience Institute. So, so I will share with you my personal experience in cranioparyngiomas. You know, the classification of stenio has been, has been a, a very well known around the world, but now really I prefer that one, the classification as Kui Chang Wang, you know, the, 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 the divide the cranioparyngiomas, the topography, subdiaphragmatic with competent diaphragm axillae, that means that you can, you, you can go easily because it's protected by by the diaphragm cellar, eh? subdiaphragmatic with incompetent diaphragm cellar. Eh? So the part of the tumor is, is going, of course, into the third ventricle. And of course, the most complicated and difficult is the supra-diaphragmatic uh, cryopharyngiomas uh, cryo completely intra, intra, intraventricular. You know, from the pathological point of view, 
He said the adamantinomatous cause is the most frequent in the pediatric, the pediatric group, you know, and papillary is more frequent in the, in the adult, adult group. But even, even in this adamantinomatous, here you can see the capsule of craniohalangioma and some islands of, of humor out of the capsule. That that's mean that sometimes it's a very, very, very difficult to obtain the total removal of the tumor. In my experience from 72 to, to until 2012, it's a 136 uh, pediatric uh, operated by, my, by me. And, and the distribution is, the, the, is more or less 50% uh, pediatric that be in between patients zero to 20 and the rest uh, I consider adult, adult patients. So it's more or less 50% of the cases. So the clinical presentation at the first con consultation, isolated or altogether, could be visual field, defect, neurological sign, and or endocrin endocrinological dysfunction. Can be altogether of, of, of only one thing that uh, led us to the, to the diagnosis. How is the treatment of the management of cardiovascular? Of course, until today, my my my, my experience is total exceresis is, is, is the best. Sorry, total exceresis is the best. Partial or puncture of of or drainage of the cyst, irradiation, stereotactic irradiation, interstitial irradiation, so radio surgery, intracystic therapy, or even abstention. So, so now, now the surgical approach. We, we the craniopharyngiomas because the topographical situation of that tumor would be different. So, my my favorite, of course, uh, 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 and, and where I have the most experience is the front of the and transylvian approach. That that means uh, I, we we did we did the majority of cases of cases with this approach. But of course. We have the transphenoidal approach that for craniofaryngioma, I don't like too much, even if I have a, a, a large experience in pituitary tumor, more than 3,000 cases, or could be by frontal interim effect in some cases through the lamina terminalis, or a, a microsurgical a transventric, transventricular in this case. Personally, I, I don't do I don't do the transventricular endoscopy. Now is my 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 assistants are doing endoscopy continuously. So this is the this is the this is the incision. Is the frontal anterior and transylvian I insist because it's necessary to open widely the sylvian fissure. In some in some cases in some cases of all we can we can go to a zygomatic a orbital zygomatic extension. And, and in this, in this, in this, in this, this is the area when we, we is necessary to work uh, in the prechiagmatic area, in the hiatus in between the, 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 the optic nerve and the carotid artery, lateral to the carotid artery, or translamina terminalis. Here in this, in this hiatus, it's important to, to don't hurt and preserve. The, the anterior, uh, uh, the posterior communicating area or the anterior coronal artery. This is, this is also very, very important. So this is an example of a, of a, of a young, of a young uh, boy with this solid, solid tumor uh, with this approach that I, that I showed you uh, in, the, in the lateral, lateral to the optic nerve in between the optic nerve and the carotid artery. So as I said you before, we work we work in, in, in this area pres preserving of course the, the branches of the carotid of the carotid artery, see? and then and then you can see you can see here, and in order to, to save and, and we and we can we can reach op op opening the liliquid membrane to the to the posterior to the posterior post. This uh, this this is a boy. This is a, a boy, not to, to, save, not to save time. The, the same thing, this solid and with a, with a small cyst tumor. And here you see they are going to peel, 
su piel de 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 Then, then we open we, we, we open the the liquid membrane here. You have the okay, and then. Now going to check the start women on front here. And then is the basilar artery here. So, so is the I don't want that's a matter of example. Translamina terminalis in the in in the in the in, in craniopharyngiomas occupying the third ventricle, translamina terminalis here. It's a, it's a very well, it's a very good approach, but it's necessary, in my opinion, a big tumor here to perform, you know, a bifrontal interhemispheric translamina terminalis, as you can see here in this, in this, uh, in this exam, in this case. So I advance in time. You can preserve both olfactory nerve. It's a, it's a, it's a nice dissection. We advance. We expose the lamina terminalis. Open there. You, you you see the brachiasmatic area is very is, is very is small. It's, it's very difficult to reach the tumor here. So we continue here. You see, this is a big tumor in a, in a patient of 60, 68 years old, a woman, and, and, and this is the, and this is the most popular. But this is, this is a very good approach, in my opinion, for this, for this kind of tumor. This is a microsurgical approach, as I, as, I, as I said, as I said, as I said. Did you see the, the, the stock? And I finish here. In, in you know, in, in patients, you know, age patient, uh, and this woman with the 70, 78 years old, just with, just with this is, this is, of course, we are going to see is to, to remove the cyst and no more and no more than that, and then and then of course we send the patient to uh, a radiotherapy or or, or, or radiotherapy. Transphenoidal, I, as I said before, transphenoidal even with the large experience that we have, the microsurgical, the microsurgical approach for cardiopharyngiomas, I don't like because it's in my opinion it's necessary to open widely. So I I continue to prefer. The transcranial, the transylvian, transylvian the, the approach. So the microsurgical and the endoscopic assisted, we has been used in, in some cases. But uh, one of my my former assistant, Dr. Abati, is doing kind of angiomas total, completely uh, endoscopically. Which is in that case, I, I, of course, I agree, I accept. You see, and she's as complete, the total removal of the tumor is very, is, is, is very, is really a, 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 a fantastic approach. So, the surgical procedure in, in these 136 cases, the total removal has been, was possible. Or in, in 60, 69% of the cases, subtotal in the 30%. As five years follow up, recurrence is free survival 
83, 83%, uh, and free survival, five-year subtotal removal, plus radiotherapy in the 33%. Of course, in the immediately post-operative uh, period, transient ADH insufficiency is, is almost, almost normal in 80% of the cases. Permanent is, is much more, is, is slower. Field deficit worsen it, worsen the endocrine, endocrine deficit, neuropsychological disorder in pediatric. It's, uh, it's really, it, it's really uh, previous, we can previous all these, all these uh, uh, deficiencies after surgery. Mortality in 3.7 or 7 of these cases. Of course, the injury, we have to, be, to pay attention, the injuries to mammillary body and mammillary thalamic tract. The patient can be awake by disorders in cognition. It's absolutely that has been present by my friend Tetsuo Kano in Nagoya in 2000, 2007. In, in children, the personality change after surgery in control pediatric cases appear in 64%. So it's very important, you know, the treatment, the psychological treatment of personality in children is absolutely mandatory. In these, in these cases. Radio surgery is made with gabanite, with my friend, my friend Julio, Julio Antico. And just uh, as a matter of example, in fe February 207, it's, it's all this tumor, and this is resolved in August 207. That means this is a possibility, possibility of treatment. This is the result of, uh, of Antico. We, we were together for so many years. So, you know, a, a decrease in the 62% increase, that means no, no results by your surgery in 22% and change in 50%. So this is also the Ostertag uh, method. That means when you have a big cyst, cyst, the patient that comes with an enormous cyst and the neurological problem is produced by the cyst, the cystoventricular connection is another possibility. Or can or can you or can you So intracystic uh, intracystic therapy, you know, uh, Antico has used in Buenos Aires in, in the eighties, the eighties, the eighties, ninety. But really, I, I I never agree with this kind of intracystic therapy. I never use not not leomycin, no interferon. Not the result, my opinion, and not and not very very satisfactory. And with the atrial renal of phosphorus, I, I, I see disaster that appear in some, in some cases. So in conclusion, in conclusion, the, the, the total removal is the first opportunity should be, should be the goal today. When this is not possible, radiosurgery is a, is a possibility. And of course, we, we have to pay attention that hormonal repla replacement, depending on the age of the patient, extension of the surgical procedure and the endocrinic deficit is absolutely necessary. So this is the craniopharyngioma is, 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 the, is the work of a team, a team that we have to consider mainly, mainly, mainly the endocrinological. So this is, this is the, this is a, 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 a a mail, a mail send, him, send me my, my dear friend, Maurice Schuchs, because uh, this, this symposium in New York uh, was organized by, by Fred Epstein, uh, late Fred Epstein, you know, and the, 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 you know, the promises, promising answer for 2007 was, and is today, and is today from Canyon Farinjoma, a reasonable surgery. And using, using microsurgery, using endoscopical assisted microsurgery, or completely endoscopic, endoscopical surgery. So again, quality of life is really the most important uh, you know, concern for, for us. And we have to, in every, not only for pharyngioma, but for every pathologist in neurosurgery should be, should be the goal. And of course, we have been discussed during the years the problem of quality of life with my dear friend and 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 and, and, and you know no 
no mentor because I I I, I never I never work with the, with with Maggi, unfortunately, but I learned many many things from, from him for his experiences and my my contact uh, for so many years with him has changed my 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 my, my way of, of perform surgery. I have been trained for a, in Paris for so many years with or Gerard Guillot was a giant in neurosurgery. But of course, Maji Sami has changed my mind in so many, in so many areas of neurosurgery. Thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much, Professor Armando Basso, uh, for this beautiful lecture about uh, surgical and treatment strategies in craniopharyngiomas. Some comments from the panelists or? Yes, um, I have a question. Um, Armando, it was a very nice presentation as, um, as usual. And I, I liked the last slide when you have uh, a couple dancing tango. That's really very, very nice. Thank <laughs> you. And uh, I have a simple question. I mean, do you think that a five-year follow-up is adequate for, especially for younger patients with craniopharyngioma? No, no, not, not, a, no, not at all, my dear Mario. It's a, just, just uh, for the presentation of, of that slides. But of course, we have to, 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 to check and to, and to uh, follow those patients 10 years and, and even 15 years, of course, of course, at all. It's not enough five years. So just to normalize the, the, that experience, it, the, I put some uh, five years and, and then, but at 10 years, it changed. Change yeah. uh, again, and yeah, you are absolutely right. And, you yeah. and then I also have um, another comment. Um, you know, we have seen in uh, multiple uh, presentation, especially endoscopic presentation, you know, beautiful view of the inside of the third ventricle after removal, complete removal, complete endoscopic removal of craniopharyngioma. But I always wonder, you know, what is the quality of this patient in which really you remove the floor of the third ventricle that last time I checked is the hypothalamus. But can you comment on that? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you know, you know the, the, the quality of life after that, doing completely, completely endoscopically is much more difficult to preserve that, that wall. I think that the, that the inter, in, uh, subfrontal, subfrontal approach, you can, you, can, you can, when you open the lamina terminalis, you can remove the tumor and you can check the walls of the third ventricle, which is the most important, the, mo the, the most important thing in craniopharyngioma surgery. And that's why I still, I, I, my my. I, I still advise to all my colleagues to to the subfrontal, you know, a transylvian approach because you can check, you can you can see when to stop. That is the that is the that is the that is the problem in current current Not 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 to produce excessively uh, terrible damage in patients. Thank you very much. I think this okay. message really needs to be to be spread across very, very forcefully, because I cannot tell you how many disasters I have seen in patients who have beautiful post-operative MRIs. And as Majid has taught us, the most important thing is the patient, is the quality of life of the patient, especially of a young patient. Thanks, Armando. Matthias, could I have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, Armando, that was great. Uh, I've got a question. You mentioned radio surgery, which is uh, definitely a good option. Sometimes you have uh, the tumor too close to the optic apparatus. Uh, do you do some surgeries like, uh, they call it chiasmoplexy, that uh, you put a little fat between the optic and the uh, tumor to enhance the possibility of radio surgery? No, no, no. I don't, I, I don't, I don't, do, I don't do it, but... Uh, 
the radio surgery now you have to be very careful the way they do radio surgery because there are so many different kinds of radio surgery you know linac radio surgery uh, uh, different kinds you know in my opinion with the, the, the gamma knife the leg cell gamma knife in my opinion because because the geometry of radiation you can you can you can define most exactly with this, uh, with, with this experience. Unfortunately, in my country, we have, even if we, we, we have the second gamma knife in the world, because La Laszlo Steiner has been working many, many times in when many years, even in Buenos Aires after, after there. But now in my country, we have the only one gamma knife in, in Buenos Aires. But the, in the rest of the country, they say radio surgery doing with, with LINAC, that with mobile, with mobile technology. And it's very difficult, very difficult to determine the exact geometry of the radiation and the dose. This is very important. So, so, so unfortunately, we have, we have many, many problems with radio surgery, not only for cryopharyngiomas, for instance, if I cannot send a patient of a, an acoustic tumor in, 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 in small or when, when radio surgery is indicated, if I cannot send to gamma knife, I don't, I don't, I, I don't never, never, I, my, my team also, we never send patient to others, let's say radio surgery. Because in general, what they do is, oh, the dose is enormous and they produce damage in, in the nerve and in the, in, even in the, in the brain, in the brain, in the, in the brain on protuberance, etc., or they, they just to prevent those things, a dose is less than which is necessary, and, and this is the problem. So, uh, normal, normally, normally in my country and in many countries, you know, in the world, the neurosurgeons don't know exactly what it means, radio surgery. I, I have been in my life very interested in radios, not, not because I perform, I never performed radio surgery, but in the problems of radiation, just to be very careful with radiation. That's why I still prefer <laughs> surgery, simple, simple surgery, but radiation is necessary in many opportunities. Of course. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vladimir, Mario, and Armando. Uh, very interesting discussion. In order to be on time, uh, we go ahead with uh, the next speaker, Professor uh, Jose Landeiro from Brazil. Uh, Jose Landeiro is professor and chairman uh, of Fluminense Federal University of Rio Grande. And uh, uh, he is um, the chairman of Skull Base Committee of the WFNS. The topic uh, that uh, Professor Landero will speak is anterior, anterior skull-based tumors moving towards new approaches. Thanks, Professor Landero, for being here with us. Did you see my, my picture there? Okay? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you for, Imad, for inviting me to this wonderful meeting in honor of Professor Sami, our teacher. And I must just say thanks, Professor Sami, for share your expertise, expertise, your knowledge, and your philosophy with us. And I'd like to see about the large influence have you had it on my life? Well, I want to talk about the anterior school-based tumors. How to choose the approach nowadays in the endoscopic era? What's happened there? Well, I, I, I do like the purpose of this presentation is to show a series of skull based tumor, most of them meningiomas, chordomas, some craniopharyngiomas place strictly on the midline and how I am choosing the best approach for this kind of tumor, mainly the endoscopic and the extended endoscopic skull base approach to the so-called craniotomy, transphenoidal craniotomy. Frontal skull base approach started on midline and the etmoid plate, the 
plano esfenoidal, de tubérculo cele, de dorsal cele, da clinoide process, e caverna sinus tumor, e place on the temporal fossa, invading the posterior fossa, e some tumors place on midline, on the clivus from the dorsal cella to the, to the cranio cervical junction. Uh, logically, is a classical example of the olfatory groove meningioma. Uh, although some authors describe the approach, the endoscopic approach to remove this tumor, still now I prefer to remove this tumor from the smallest craniotomy or traditional subfrontal approach has preconized by Professor Sami. Look at this tumor, we remove to the small frontal orbital craniotomy, include the bone invading by the tumor and immediate postoperative view and look at the, the area covered by graft from the pericranial fascia. You see, my, my 10 years later, tumors operated to the transcranial approach, include the olfatory groove meningioma, planus phenoidal, tuberculosis cella, and clinoidal meningioma. I have a, one patient died due to vasospasm after vasospasm followed by brain infarct. It's due to after totally removal of a clinoidal meningioma type 2, according to our MEFT classification. The tumor involved the carotid artery, but didn't encase the carotid artery. But uh, even to the patient developed severe vasospasm 10 days later, the surgery, and with it followed by brain fart and died. Is the only opt in this patient. I, my surgical mortality, mortality is zero, one month mortality, one patient, in new visual deficit, only one patient. But I'd like to, to talk, my change sometimes my mind for removing some tumors placed on midline and anteriorly to the neural structures. The advantages of the endoscopic endonasal approach include direct access to the lesion located at the cilla, supracilla, region, anterior skull base, and clivus. Don't need the brain exposure or retraction of the brain, no need for trepassing the nerves to reach the tumor, promote the early vascularization of tumor and best visualization of the ventral structures. But there are some disadvantages too. It's not suitable for lesions that extend a little posterior or lateral to the cranial nerves. And I reinforce my message. The tumor must be placed strictly on midline. The CSF leak, the risk recently lower after the nasal flat. Nowadays, it's the same or lesser than traditional skull base approach, but it need a long learning curve, more demanding in non-pneumatized sphenoidal sign, but now with a good drill, you can solve easily the problem. And not suitable for some calcified or hard tumors, and this class of tumor can limit the extension of the resection. This is my theory. Logically, most of the tumor operated were pituitary tumor, but I have many tuberculosis cells, stasio neuroblastoma, pituitary tumor with the cavernous sinus invasive. is a new perspective after endoscopic approach, cordomas, craniopharyngiomas, all of them operated under the endoscopic approach, pure endoscopic approach. Look at this tumor, is an acromegalic patient who tumor invading the cavernous sinus and are classified as KNOSP3. This tumor can be treated radically, radically because not always hormonal treatment 
is available for this patient. And then, as you can see, after transpterygoid approach, you can see here the carotid artery, the carotid artery, the pituitary gland is here, work below the carotid artery, middle the carotid artery, look at the knee, and then I can, trepassing, I can mobilize the carotid artery more laterally and more medially and remove it, the tumor totally and give a new chance for the tumor. That's, there is no better approach to invading cavernous sinus pituitary adenoma than the endoscopic and the nasal approach. Look at it. There is no better place to endoscopic and nasal approach for tumors placed on middly, middly to the orbit. The middle wall to the orbit, like it's menin, a, a typical meningioma who invade in the orbit, and then it's easy to reach to the endoscopic and nasal approach. As you can see here, prepare the flap, displace the flap inferiorly, remove all the midline structure, is a, the lamina, the lamina, quadrangular lamina, and the vomer, and the anterior nasal septum, and prepare for enter in the sphenoidal sinus. Look at the, the nasal flap, pedicle nasal flap, displaced from below to below. And here you have the midline, and then I open all the sphenoidal sinus, more laterally include, and you can go to the tumor placed medially on the orbit. The tumor destroyed the medial wall of the orbit and then was easy to remove the tumor. And this is a better way than to go from above. As you can see here, the tumor is easy from middle. You can touch the orbit and you can see uh, you can think well when the tumor were removed. Look here, after removing the tumor, you can see the space created after remove the tumor, sorry by the interference in my arm. Look at this anterior skull-based malignancy. There is a place for the neurosurgeon now when to deal the olfactory neuroblastoma. Look at the tumor, is the tumor placed on midline? Is the tumor invading the dura? And then you can do a, a radical re resection, including the dura, the mucosa, close to the tumor, and until you found the inferior, the, the orbital lobe, the frontal orbital lobe, and then you cover. In this case, you, I use the fascia lata, because the flap sometimes can be infiltrated by the tumor, the mucosa close to the flap, and then we prefer to use the fascia lata. And as you can see here, the tumor were totally removed together the dura. The risk of fistula exists, but there is no better way than endoscopic endonasal approach for removing this tumor. Look at And then, as you can see, the image of the inferior part of the frontal lobe, the interhemispheric space, and you can cover all the things with the fascia lata and fiber and glue. But the tuberculum cell meningiomas, that is a, is a great challenge today because many autos prefer to remove the tumors from below. But for me, sometimes I use, I can offer the patient, but depends on the position of the tumor. Tumor must be placed in a strictly on midline no vascular encasement, the both carotid the arteries, the anterior cerebral artery, all of them must become free. No optic 
canal invasement and the tumor preferentially be soft or cystic. And the, the surgery promote uh, early vascularization of the tumor, don't need the mobilization of the optic nerve, and you can preserve the small perforates of the optic nerve because the small perforates of the optic nerve can be medially to centrally. Look at this, this case is a tuberculum cell meningioma, touch the diaphragma, uh, extend the transphenoidal approach, and open, communicate the pituitary fossa with the anterior cranial fossa. As you can see here, the optic nerve, the tumor removed from the optic nerve, carotid artery, and both anterior cerebral arteries, and the postoperative view. And then, I'd like to, to call attention about uh, some nuances in tobacco no cell meningioma. I published a paper more than 10 years ago. And in my series, about 50% of the tobacco no cell meningioma invading the optic canal. Most of the times, this tumor can invade it formidably and then the, this part can be removed to the nose, but sometimes the tumor invading circumferentially surrounding of the optic nerve invaded the canal from above, from middle, from laterally, and from below. And then you need to have a, a final cut of MIR, discuss this case with a neuroradiologist, and if say there is invasive of the optic canal, I, in this case, specific case, I will prefer to do a subcranial, subfrontal approach because it's more easy to mobilize, it's easy to unroof the optic canal and remove the tumor involved in invading the optic canal. And remember, the main cause of a recurrence in tuberculosis cell meningioma is invading, is the part of the tumor live inside the optic canal. About the craniopharyngioma, you know, Professor Armando said about the, the disease. Uh, uh, I, when I, I, I deal with the patient with the clinic for idioma. You must have a, something about the, the visual impairment, the endocrinological function, and define how to be aggressive with the tumor. Because sometimes, sometimes, most of the patients in, in the public hospital don't have a condition to do a hormonal replacement and there is no good uh, focal radiotherapy. And then I need to be aggressive. I try to preserve the pituitary stalk in order to preserve some uh, endocrinological function. Logically, the tumor who is pending laterally or to posterior fossa, the tumor who invading the, the ventricle and harder calcified tumor is not amenable to endoscopic approach. As you can see, but this is ideal case, some cystic, some solid inside the cell. And then look at this. I expose the anterior cranial fossa and the pituitary fossa, and I communicate the pituitary fossa with the anterior fossa uh, after open the anterior cavernal sinus, prepare because sometimes bleeding. And with this approach, I can see the transition between the pituitary, the talk, the, the stalk, and the optic nerve and optic asthma and remove the tumor in order to, to have a heart radical resection. This surgery, when the tumor is placed into the cell, or even with the supracellular extension, but on midline, you can remove it totally without any consequence. Professor Lambdero, you have two minutes more. Okay. And uh, uh, the post-operative view, 
is a, a granuloma operated to the same side, to the same approach. I, I could remove a good part of the tumor, but not total because there is a firm adherence with a optic nerve. And there is no better place to remove a tumor such as chordomas, because chordomas is a tumor placed on the midline, don't need trepassing the nerve, don't need mobilize the brain stem, and then you can remove the tumor. Look is the pituita, the dorsal cella, the uh, lateral limits of this approach because the petros carotid, the pretos carotid, the artery, and on the midline you can have access from the dorsal cella to the foramen magnum, and then you can remove the tumors. You can remove the tumors. All the cordoma, all the cordoma, as you can see. But I repeat, the tumor must be placed strictly on the middle line. On the left side, the patient developed the encephalo, uh, pneumocephalus in the postoperative period, but doesn't have a problem. As you can see, the tumor, and after remove the tumor, you have a encephalocele, but you can compress and put it the graft over and the patient doesn't have any problem. Is a, another cordoma I remove on the same side and the tumor compressed before, compressed the interpeduncular system, but after remove, you can see a good space between the area, remove the tumor and the, the, the cerebral peduncle. And for all, for last but not least, I, I'd like to talk about the semiclival meningiomas. If the meningioma is placed on the midline, the endoscopic endonasal approach offer a, a good way to remove that tumor. Like here, the, this the tumor comes from the dorsal cell to the, the foramen magnum, and then open the clivus between both petroclival arteries. And then you can see the vertebral arteries, the basilar artery, the vertebral artery, close to the, in advance of the vertebral artery, you can see the brainstem, open the dura, you can see the tumor here, and the tumor where totally remove that to the transphenoidal extended root, as you can see here, after remove and the graft place on the midline. And this is my series. I, I can achieve a good results, but nowadays with more experience, I can do much more and more safe and more radical approach to some chordomas and to some clival meningioma. The complication is not so bigger, is not so bigger, and doesn't alter the successful course of our patient. We have one patient died with a clival meningioma, but one, one year later because I decompress on the midline, but the tumor is growing and the patient refuses a new surgery. And then uh, I would like to, to, to leave my comments. Uh, I think the transcranial approach offer a clear advantage of endoscopic approach for large olfactory groove meningioma, but select case, case of plano meningioma, sphenoidal and tubercular cell meningioma, endoscopic skill based approach can offer a good way and good resection and good visual recovery of this patient. But nowadays, I consider the endoscopic skill based approach an ideal approach to cordomas placed on the midline, and I consider skull based endoscopic scalp based approach for some clival and for a magnum meningioma. Thanks for all. Thank you very much, Professor Landeiro. Every time it's a pleasure to listen to you, to you with these uh, amazing lectures. Thanks again. Uh, we have not time for, for comment or for question, but 
Uh, I want to, to ask to Professor Landero if you can be attentive to the chat and uh, we will be very happy uh, if uh, we receive uh, some question of comment from the participants in the chat and if you can respond to them uh, we will be thank uh, very thankful professor landero thanks again thank for being uh, in this special session for honoring professor sami thank you okay the next speaker is professor joan stefan florian from romania uh, professor uh, Florian is professor and chairman of Liliu Hatiganu, rector of the University Senate Liliu Hatiganu, Cluj Napoca, Romania, uh, and the lecturer uh, of our next speaker is uh, Skullbase Meningiomas: Lessons Learned from Professor Sami. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. And I would like to start uh, thanking to Professor Imad Kanan and uh, to Professor Vladimir Benesh for organizing this very inspired uh, session and for inviting me here to present what I learned from uh, Professor uh, Sami in uh, this field of skull based meningioma. And uh, I would like also to thank Professor Sami uh, for helping me to become what I am these days. So uh, I will I will try to present my point of view and how I how I uh, perceive uh, uh, the lessons from Professor Sami in a more didactical manner. So the first lesson I'm coming from the eastern part of Europe. And uh, at the beginning of my experience, uh, we were not so equipped and our possibility to, to, to learn were uh, quite limited. So I tried hardly to find everything I uh, have got uh, to, to see who is uh, Professor Majid Sami. And uh, I was impressed uh, by the uh, by the Professor Peter Black, uh, the former president of World Federation, who mentioned that no one in neurosurgery today can match Majid Sami's surgical skill and judgment, excellence in teaching, administrative accomplishment, and world understanding. Uh, Professor Stephen Hines mentioned that he may he has made me a better surgeon. He has made many neurosurgeons around the world, better surgeons. And it's also my case. Indeed, in individuals who have been touched by Majid Sami, mentioned Ricardo Ramina, continue to share his dream and will carry his legacy into the future. And it is the case of this webinar. And for that, I would like to uh, uh, congratulate our uh, chairmen of the uh, of the uh, um, anatomy uh, uh, world federation uh, anatomy uh, microsurgical anatomy uh, uh, committee for organizing this this uh, meeting so professor sami was not only a very skilled surgeon he was an innovator and at the beginning of his career, he uh, imagined the multidisciplinarity approach in the pathology of skull base. He was one of those who defined the skull base surgery. And as Professor Amirati also mentioned, he, 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 he developed and mastered the skull base surgery from almost all uh, point of views. Along with Professor Draf, he wrote the first textbook on skull base surgery, an interdisciplinary approach. And together with uh, uh, the same professor, he organized the first skull base surgery course. And uh, 
it's worth mentioning that along with Professor Hugo Fisch from Zurich, an EMT surgeon, they organized the first international skull-based congress. So they together developed the concept of skull-based surgery and based on their experience and based on, on experience he got in time, he developed what I see to be the main principles of Sami's neurosurgery. He mentioned that for me, the art of neurosurgery is to use simple approaches and evaluate which allow, allow for sufficient access to the tumor and avoid any risk to the cranial nerves and other critical structures. A fundamental principle is that dissection of the tumor capsule from surrounding structures should be performed only when sufficient internal decompression has been achieved. And uh, taking in consideration these two uh, concepts, he developed uh, uh, with increasing experience the concept of limited access. And for he, and also for me in time, the simple frontolateral approach uh, proved to be sufficient to access all the meningiomas from the uh, anterior skull base. And uh, the main advantages are of this uh, frontolateral approach, it's his simplicity and flexibility. And uh, it's worth to mention also that with adequate positions, a simple maneuvers uh, of the patient's head and early cerebral fluid uh, release, the need of, for brain retraction gets avoided. So based on the lessons I have learned uh, from this point of view, my involution from uh, more than uh, almost 20 years ago uh, in, was starting from the prefrontal terrenal that I described. It was a modified terrenal, large terrenal approach. I was very satisfied for large uh, tumors in the anterior skull base. And uh, at that time, in my point of view, uh, it offers uh, many advantages and especially the multi-directional approach of the tumor. But in time, I discovered that it also offers uh, some disadvantages. This multidirectional approach also uh, uh, put the risk of the uh, uh, brain for the brain for multidisciplinary uh, multidirectional uh, aggressions. Uh, for for performing this that approach, you need a much long time, and the exposure of the brain it's uh, much longer and there is an increased risk of post-operative complications. So in time, I went through a front octarinal approach and now in the most of the, in, in the large majority of the cases, I use the frontolateral approach even for the vascular lesions um, like aneurysmal surgery. So I also, um, learned from Professor uh, Sami that it's necessary to know the, the, uh, uh, the anatomy and the role of arachnoid layer. And in parallel with Professor, uh, Professor Vladimir uh, uh, Benesh, we studied the, the, the role of the uh, arachnoid uh, system, the basal system in the development of the meningiomas, skull-based meningiomas, and based on on uh, our studies, we uh, conclude that the limitation of the meningioma into a specific system are demonstrated by the similar aspect of the tumor, the membranes and other arachnoidal structures along with the neurovascular structure will conduct the further expansion of the tumor. And based on this concept, we develop um, a, personal, uh, a personal classification for the posterior uh, for some meningiomas, I, I will uh, present a little bit later. But this concept of Professor Ch Sami of transtumoral route, along with the navigating the sister, offered the possibility of a less invasive approach for those located in anterior skull base, the frontolateral uh, 
uh, approach for those located in the posterior fossa, the retrosigmoidian or posterolateral median suboccipital, and for these located for in the middle fossa, the subtemporal or terrional approach. Um, the advantages of uh, the frontolateral approach in, uh, for example, olfactory groove meningiomas are many. And uh, I would like only to underline what also Professor Sami mentioned many times. You avoid the opening of frontal sinuses, you have an access, uh, uh, easy access to uh, basally devascularize the tumor, early identify uh, the ipsilateral optic nerve and carotid artery so you can manage all the vital structure, early identify of posterior feeders of the tumor and also you can preserve the contralateral ophthalmic tract. The disadvantages are not so many, but important. You have a difficult contralateral bleeding control and no control on the bridging vase. And that for that, there is a risk of ex vacuo subdural hematoma. Um, and in the last years, I only perform in such large tumors like olfactory groove tumor, uh, tumors, the frontolateral you see here, a complete removal of the tumor with um, no traction and uh, no uh, secondary lesion on the brain, even if the tumor were quite large. And the same principle are applied for the tuberculum uh, region tumors. And uh, you see free, with this small approach, small opening, you can easily uh, uh, reach the ba base of the tumor. You started uh, to devascularize, and then uh, after you, you completely devascularize the, the, the base of the tumor, you, you reduce progressively. And only when the tumor has reduced the volume sufficiently, you can mobilize into the, uh, into the uh, uh, arachnoidal layer, which acts like a lubricant. So, uh, you can dissect uh, sharply all the vessels uh, around the tumor. They are protected by their own arachnoidal layer. So preserving all this structure and mobilizing progressively, mobilizing the tumor uh, and progressively reducing with, as professor mentioned, whatever method you have, uh, you can completely remove without any harm on the uh, vital structure. So for tumors uh, uh, located a little bit la laterally and in, uh, uh, into the middle fossa, the uh, clinoidal meningioma or sphenoid alarm meningiomas, uh, uh, he, he uh, it's in favor of frontal temporal root. And uh, for those with a primary or secondary uh, Cavernous sinus involvement. Um, the, he also used the frontolateral approach, which uh, he considered, and I also consider the most appropriate. I don't like the orbital, front orbital zygomatic uh, approaches. I performed that. I knew, I know how how they are, uh, 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 what advantages they are offering, but also I know. Uh, what are the complications uh, in the postoperative period? So, uh, Professor uh, uh, Sami mentioned that they are in. Uh, it's no need to remove all the tumor with all the cost, and uh, there is no attempt is made to remove the most aderent portion with uh, of infiltrative growing meningiomas. Such treatments uh, can be effectively treated by radius surgery, and. Uh, in our surgical strategy, we perform a fashion perioral craniotomy. Uh, we, uh, I, I would like to, to remove the sphenoidal ridge and uh, I perform a limited posterior orbitotomy only that in the cases of sphenoorbital invasion. And also I perform an intradural optic canal unroofing and uh, clinoidectomy because I can identify the vascular and the uh, optic nerve uh, uh, and I have them on the control. 
my concept is instead of bone, remove the tumor, it's easier even for the patient. And the, the challenges for clinoidal meningiomas are uh, when you enter the Sylvian Fischer dissect to preserve the, the, the veins uh, uh, as much as possible and to dissect the major vessels that are encircled by the tumor and the, to preserve the optic nerve and the uh, optic nerve vascularization and the, the uh, third nerve. This is a case, I will not present all the cases. I don't know how much time uh, I have. Um, again, the same concept, basal devascularization, progressive reduction, and uh, finally the complete removal with um, uh, uh, very nice anatomy. So these are only few examples in which I perform a pterional approach, a limited pterional approach for tumors that uh, secondarily invade the uh, cavernous sinus. As professor mentioned, uh, I also use the pterional approach and uh, he, I started to, to open the Sylvian Fisher as close as uh, possible to the opening nerve. Uh, I feel that uh, there is a, a more, more appropriate and uh, uh, more visible. You have a constant uh, uh, landmark, which is the optic nerve. And then I, I open it from medial to lateral in order to preserve also the veins. And again, I start with the basal vascul uh, devascularization and then uh, uh, decompress the tumor and the, the most delicate uh, uh, step it's when you uh, dissect the tumor from the edge of the uh, tentorial uh, uh, tentorium in order to so be, yes Florian, you have okay. two minutes more yes uh, I, I will uh, go a little bit uh, faster the petroclival meningioma uh, Professor Sami, uh, it's very much in favor of the simple retrosigmoidal approach, and the supra retrosigmoidal supra metal was also uh, uh, already mentioned by Professor uh, 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 Amirati, I think. And uh, based on this concept, we can uh, remove quite large tumors uh, like this one, uh, and we. Uh, after uh, basal devascularization and uh, also uh, supramatal drilling, of, uh, uh, we can uh, devascularize that and then we can mobilize the tumor, can dissect uh, the nerves into the, their uh, own arachnoidal layer. The porous, uh, Yes, it's, it's open largely enough in order to, to uh, permit a reduction of the tumor, extend the tumor into the cavum metallic. And uh, this approach was also, it's also very versatile and you can also use it as a, for, for uh, supra cerebral approach as Professor Vladimir Benesh uh, use it very frequently and I le learned he, uh, uh, this type of approach and uh, uh, with a very good uh, result. I also use for posterior force and uh, semi-sitting position and you see how large space. And another lesson that it's the, uh, not necessary to remove all the tumor in the single step, uh, it's maybe better to use two steps surgery using two uh, to uh, simple approach like uh, approaches like perional and combined with retro sigmoidal approach like in this uh, very large meningioma for foramen uh, magnum meningiomas also uh, uh, the advice and i follow his advice it's the sim uh, use simple approach simple median approach uh, or lateral approach and i always remember uh, professor sami mentioning what is the extreme lateral, transcondylar extreme lateral? I, I don't see uh, their necessity in the most of the uh, uh, foramen magnum uh, meningiomas. And um, based on the grow, uh, concept that the growing tumor creates its own space, displacing the large vessels and the nerves, but generally respecting their arachnoidal layer and uh, 
based on the concept of transtumoral root, which is the uh, central issue of the management of philosophy for the different cranial base of uh, Professor Sami, you can see how easily you can perform uh, even a tumor uh, with an anterior insertion, you can completely remove the tumor uh, without performing two large lateral extension of the tumor, only taking advantage of the space created by the tumor itself. So, so Florian, we yes, are on time. Uh, 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 and, uh, instead of conclusion, the only, I, I will uh, give some uh, uh, a conclusion from Professor Sami, the only real treasures a neurosurgeon can have in his life are his patients. Make it simple. If doesn't, if caps, if the capsule doesn't move, it's only mean that you didn't decompress enough. And another great neurosurgeon and anatomist mentioned that Professor Sami, it's a master surgeon, world leader, outstanding educator, great humanitarian, neurosurgical architect, and treasure friend. And. Uh, Thank you, Professor Majid Sami, for being the great conductor of Neurosurgical Symphony. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Florian, uh, for your outstanding lecture. And um, in order to be on time, we have space for one question of or comment, as the panelists prefer. I don't know if there is some comment. Okay, going ahead with the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Apio Antunes from Brazil. Uh, he's professor and, uh, and head section of neurosurgery of Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. And uh, the next speak is about parasagittal meningiomas, Simpson rate of resection and long-term recurrence rate. Hello, uh, hello, Professor Apio, are you here? Yes, I'm here, I'm just sharing. Thanks. You okay. have 15 minutes uh, for the lecture. Are going, sorry. Yes, no problem. I think that you, you need to push the play, the play button. Yeah, but anyway, it should be, you're not seeing my screen, no? Yes, I, I observe perfectly your screen and- ah, okay. You, Is that all right now? Yes, can you put play? Okay, yeah. In, in order to observe the, the whole screen. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Imad and Professor Benis for the invitation to participate in this meeting. Uh, my talk is on parasagittal meningiomas, and as I understand, there are a lot of young people watching this meeting. I, sh I selected some papers that I understand are important for the manager of the disease. I have no disclosures, and as you all know, th this term is in includes all patients who present with tumors involving the sagittal sinus and the adjacent convexity dura and fault. So that's why we call parasagittal and fault meningiomas. Uh, the definition of the World Health Org Organization is this one, all of, all of us we know. And that the special thing is that the grade one, all the classifications are done, mean the same thing as regards prognosis. And of course, the clinical symptoms of the disease depend mainly on the size of the tumor and the location according to the anterior third, middle third, and posterior third of the sinus. The main and most important paper was published many, many years ago, 1957, by Donald Simpson, in which he uh, referred the grade of resection with the recurrence rate. 
So the most important thing of this paper that even in grade one patients, we have at least a recurrence rate of 9%. We had also the work of Bonal and Brochi in 78, in which he, they classified the parasalgital meningiomas in six groups, according to the amount of tumor that invaded and or occluded the sites. Also, Professor Sandu was a uh, very aggressive surgeon in the proper sense, and he suggested that every tumor should be resected at all completely, even if he had to resect the outer dura of the layer, outer dura layer, even he had to repair the dural defect, he had to patch the sinus or perhaps a bypass of the sinus. Both of Professor Brochi and Professor Sandu later on said that they changed their mind and that of course, they said that many patients they did wouldn't do so much and perhaps send them to radio surgery. This paper from the group of California, San Francisco is a very important one. 10 years ago, they said that patients with grade one, two, three or four had the same five year recurrence rate. This means to say that the Simpson rate of resection is not the only consideration considering the recurrence rate the long-term recurrence rates. And uh, well, Nanda, who he was a very experienced surgeon on meningiomas, he stated in 2016 that in fact, the Simpson grade of resection was important indeed for the resection and the prognosis of these patients. Uh, this also in 2017, uh, this paper was a, a multimodal treatment. They state that nowadays the resection of these tumors and the proper radiosurgical or focused radiosurgery is the best treatment for these patients, considering that no one should try to take all the tumors when they invaded the sagittal sites. And uh, the interesting also of this paper is that when we do an aggressive operation and we do a non-aggressive operation, the good results are the same, but the bad results are much more frequent when we are aggressive because we produce venous infarction and we produce deficits. And uh, also this paper, they, this is a recent one, 2019, they say also that in patients with grade, who grade one patients, uh, a Simpson 1 or Simpson 2, they do have the same recurrence rate in the long run. Uh, uh, the, the, the last papers which I want to refer is this, this and this one, in which they clearly state that besides the Simpson rate of resection, the post-operative imaging is so important as the Simpson rate as for the long-term recurrence. For the young people, I su suggest to watch this paper or to read this paper from Neuron College in which the authors also suggest which are the preoperative and intraoperative checklists to be sure we're doing a good operation for parasagital meningitis. Well, okay, so let our case series, we have a more than 200 meningiomas, we selected 34 parasitical meningiomas, which is a series of 16%. There's a clear predominance of female, and the age was at around 60 years old, which is the common sense. The, the symptoms, we, we found 44% presented with seizure, 36% of patients had a progressive motor deficit, especially the ones who had a tumor at the middle third, behavior disturbance, and of course, headache in 47% of patients. The location, there was a bit more on the right side, but there's no real reason for that. The sinus involvement we found in 30% of cases, and the middle third uh, uh, had 61% of cases involved the middle third of the sinus. The Karnofsky, preoperative Karnofsky status was, we selected, of course, most of the patients had a very good Karnofsky rate and also a very good modifying ranking scale. 
This is, of course, the best result we can find. At the end of the operation, tumor is out, there's definitely no hypertension. But it's not always the case. And of course, some cases in, in an old patient, perhaps the good choice for a parasitical meningioma may be conservative treatment, considering this patient had a normal neurological examination and had this small tumor that we could follow easily with MRI. We can have patients with parasitical meningiomas with cystic components, which sometimes is not so easy to resect, but sometimes we can see as the post-operative CT, a complete resection. Sometimes we have bone erosion, and sometimes in the same patient we have sinus compression, but in this patient, if we, if we do a careful operation, we can take the whole tumor out. And sometimes we do have sinus invasion like this, seen at that venous angiogram, at venous MRI angiogram. We have bone erosion, the scalp deformity, so it's a much bigger operation. And we, we, of course, we have to resect the bone and need for a craniopathy. Sometimes the tumor are very big, and sometimes they will have not very much edema. We have a very big sinus compression, but we don't have complete occlusion. And as you can see in the post-operative CT, we can resect completely the tumor without significant edema. Uh, this is another to reinforce for the youngsters that the venous MRI, especially the axial one, is very important for the planning of the operation. Sometimes we see patients with involvement of the sinus, but uh, complete occlusion, this sometimes makes the operation a little bit easier than when there's a partial uh, compression. And uh, of course, we have this last one, which is just meaning that the patient had a very big tumor, and this patient had a multiple uh, a syndrome of multiple tumors because she had also a rectum adenocarcinoma and endometrioid adenocarcinoma. Well, we had a resection rate of uh, uh, Simpson 1 in 23% and 50% in grade 2. In patients, uh, according to the sinus involvement, we had no invasion. We have total resection 20. When we had partial occlusion, we had uh, four cases. All of them, we had a complete resection. And of course, when we had, uh, of course, no. When we had a complete occlusion in two patients, due to the involvement of the bone and to the skull and to the uh, subcutaneous tissue, we couldn't resect completely the tumor. And according to the WHO grades, we had 82% with grade one, 14% grade two, and 3% grade three, considering that we had bone involvement in 23%. This means that bone involvement not always means malignant progression of the tumor. The follow-up, we had uh, two perioperative deaths. We'll see you later, but one patient who had a, a pulmonary embolism and one patient 30 days post-operative came back to the hospital with uh, broken pneumonia and followed by sepsis. We could follow these patients for the mean time of 51 months, and in these patients, the mean time to recurrence or progression was about 36 months. That means three years with a range between seven and 57 months. The recurrence rate or progression rate, according to Simpson, we could see that in Simpson 1 patients, we had no progression, no recurrence. In Simpson grade 2, we had three recurrences. And 3 and 4, of course, we had residual tumors that progressed. For the, for the tumors that had no growth, I mean residual tumor without growth, most of these patients, we followed up, as you can see on the right side, and two of them, we decided to, operate, uh, to treat because although there was no uh, uh, progression of the tumor, these patients had a, a big residual, so we decided to irradiate. And the patient who had a progression of the lesion, there were uh, two patients with Simpson three. We had, they were followed by three or four years 
And then we decided to reoperate, followed by radiosurgery. And one was not operated, but submitted to radiosurgery. Our outcome, which is important, uh, at least 44% of patients had no deficit in the post-operative period. But considering that we had patients, most of them presenting with the middle third of the sinus, we had a 41% grade of hemiparesis, which fortunately got better as you see in the next uh, slide. We have 3% three, three of patients presenting with uh, uh, hemianopsia, which were the patients who had tumors in the posterior third of the sinus. Uh, the deficit, which we had in 13 patients, got better in 70% of them. And, and the 31%, and the, the five patients who didn't got better were the patients who had the clear preoperative deficit and had a long disease without, uh, before the operation which is a problem sometimes in our national health system. But as you can see here in the muscle strength, most of the patients got much better. And the, according to the British Medical Council muscle strength, most of them were independent for life. So the, if the deficit was not significant, they were completely independent, even though they were not normal. This is my presentation. Thank you, Matthias, and thank you for the organizers. Thank you, Apio, for your beautiful lecture about your experience in those difficult kind of uh, parasagital and sagittal meningiomas. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, one. Yeah, I will do it now. One minute more. Uh, if the panelists uh, have any questions. Excuse me, may I ask something to Professor Antunes? Yeah, please. Sure. Uh, I'm just trying to unshare my screen, but go on. Okay. It's already unshared, um, Prof. Antonius. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Professor Antunes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I appreciated very much your, your presentation on uh, this uh, special issue of uh, parasagittal meningiomas. But when we speak about recurrence, you know very well that uh, the follow-up is very important. So it, we probably, we need uh, no less than 10 years to say exactly what is the recurrence rate. Uh, may I have your comment? Oh, yes, you, you, are, you are absolutely right. What I said is that the mean, mean follow-up was five years. Oh. So this means that we had patients with 10 and patients with three and patients with two and patients with seven. But of course, in meningiomas, we have to follow sometimes this patient for 20 years. And this series is, is a recent series coming from 2007. This means 14 years, but certainly uh, is not enough to say this patient won't have a recurrence. So we'll have to follow these patients for more 10 or 15 years to be sure they won't come back. I agree. I agree with you. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker uh, is Professor Jax Morcos. Uh, we, we are very great, grateful to him because we know that he is dealing with the medial spinal wing meningioma now and we appreciate a lot to be here with us. Uh, Professor Jacques Morkold from Department of Neuro uh, Neurological Surgery of the University of Miami. Um, he is chairman of the WFNS uh, Constitution and Bylaws Committee. The, the title of he, his, his lecture is Surgery of Brainstem Cavernomas Strategy Born uh, from a nexus of anatomy, pathology and ergonomic, a small legacy. Thank you very much, Professor Morcos. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. That's Great. Right. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to participate in, in this. Uh, thank you, uh, Imad, for organizing it. And of course, this is a Majid Sami legacy. My disclosures are uh, irrelevant. Uh, I don't need to repeat what has been said about Dr. Sami, but I want you 
to watch the elegance of his hands, uh, of his fingers. And this is really, uh, um, what can we say about his surgical genius? I, I can summarize a few points. I think unimitable strategic simplicity, ergonomically optimized dexterity, supreme confidence, conviction, and courage, precision in thinking and executing, unquenchable curiosity and creativity, and many other things that I think fit very well with the topic that I chose today, which is brainstem cavernoma. And by the way, Majid, happy belated birthday. You celebrated your birthday 11 days ago on June 19. So very privileged to be part of this today. Take you back to a paper that uh, Dr. Sami has published in 2001 on surgical management of brainstem cavernomas. I refer you to that experience of 36 cases at the time. So what I will talk about today is some anatomy, surgical principles, and case examples of brainstem cavernomas. Uh, there are many young people, I hope, in the audience, so I want to remind them what the pure anatomy is of the brainstem, uh, classically divided into the segments, diencephalon, mesencephalon, the pons, the medulla, and some cross-sections rostrally and caudally of these, the medulla, pons, and midbrain, will show you what lives there. Uh, very quickly, just look at the colors of the important structures going through rostral midbrain, caudal midbrain, the pons. You can see that the pons is a bit more forgiving because there is a, a, a more so-called safe entry zones. This is a caudal pons. This is a rostral medulla, tough area, very dense with important structures. This is a caudal medulla. When you talk, this was pure anatomy. When you talk about surgical anatomy, we have to remember and always give credit to Albino Bricolo for his original work and this concept of risky areas, which you can see on the left, and the relatively safe entry zones you can see on the right. Uh, this is, and all the subsequent work really is an adaptation of what Albino Bricolo has done particularly in, with, this, uh, in, with respect to gliomas of the, of the brainstem. Uh, a more recent paper in green would be considered safe entry zones. I'm gonna tell you in a second why that is a very confusing concept. But uh, for example, at the anterior aspect of the midbrain, the intercollicular posteriorly, laterally at the lateral mesencephalic sulcus, what I personally don't consider safe zones that have been said to be safe zones in the midline of the pons behind the basilar or between the, uh, the MLFs posteriorly, that's a very dangerous area. However, the suprafacial and infrafacial entry zones are good in green. And my favorite are the peritrigeminal entry zones and the lateral aspect of the pons. In the medulla, uh, around the olive uh, is your best shot usually, sometimes a dors dorsal midline myelotomy, uh, but not anteriorly between the pyramids. So here I summarized for you what could be considered all the possible safe entry zones in and the uh, midbrain pons and medulla. Now, on top of that, of course, you have to add all the surgical approaches that get you there. And here are, the, this is a selection of the various approaches we can consider. The next two or three slides, I think, are at, I consider the most important parts of the talk. What, what, what are the goals? What are the strategies? And what are the tactics when you want to remove a brainstem cavernoma? The goals is how you conceptually reason through it. The strategy is how you plan analytically. And the tactics is the actual execution of your surgery. So what I'd like to do is to summarize in this table what I consider the four steps 
for each of the goals, the strategy and the tactics. I don't think I have the time to read the entire slide, but it's just a concept. How do you get there? How do you find the lesion? How do you leave no trace? And how do you resect it completely? Same thing for strategies. You need to know surface geometry, depth geometry, optimal intraaxial neural path, and your microsurgical ergonomics that Professor Sami is such a master of. And of course, the tactics, how do you save, the, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, how do you save the DVA, uh, evacuate the hematoma, avoiding corner it, many, many little details. I wish I had the time to go over, but I don't. Here is, I would like to summarize for you what I have certainly made mistakes in the past and how you learn from them. And I've summarized what I think are the most common mistakes with brainstem cavernomas. Number one, not knowing when not to operate, meaning inappropriately aggressive or inappropriately conservative. Next thing, anatomy does not mean pathology. This concept of safe entry zone is totally meaningless when there is a lesion that distorts the anatomy. Favorable geometry does not mean favorable physiology. For example, this so-called two-point method of choosing your surgical approach, well, it doesn't work very well for the floor of the fourth ventricle. As you can see in the depiction there, you don't want to go through the floor of the fourth ventricle to get this lesion. It is sometimes better to go through a so-called longer path as long as you're avoiding important structure. So the two-point method is a useful starting point for you to start thinking what approach to use, but you have to modify it. So thinking of this table I just showed you, step one to step four, if you do suboptimal execution of the first two steps, then you will have suboptimal execution of step three and four. Uh, people talk about the mulberry appearance of cavernoma. I like to think of it as a red cauliflower, like the picture you see. Why is that? Because it is very easy to miss a piece of the cauliflower if you're not careful. And it's important because it's not a smooth lesion to grab and look for every possible piece. Another lesson I learned, small veins draining the cavernoma into the main DVA should be resected. I want to be very clear. I am not saying remove the DVA. I'm saying remove the small vein. There's always a small vein that drains the cavernoma into a main DVA. Save the DVA, but take the vein. Otherwise, you'll have recurrences. Radio surgery has no role, absolutely no role in cavernoma. Uh, I don't have time to go over the literature, but even our friends in Sweden agree with that concept. So surgical approaches, many publications have been done where you choose an approach based on the target and the other way around. This is a list, a partial listing of all the possible surgical approaches to the brainstem. Uh, Spetzler uh, at the time certainly had the largest uh, experience of close to 400, but even in his hands, look at the morbidity, new permanent post-op deficits, 35%, resolution of all pre-op symptoms, 52%, new deficits, 53%. A meta-analysis of some of the world literature of, of uh, more than 2,000 cases, gives a very similar uh, uh, summary of results. It is clearly not an easy surgery. The, the, the main thing is decision making and executing properly based on those uh, four steps I think I mentioned earlier. So we owe Rotten an immense debt of gratitude for anatomy. So I'm going to use his anatomy to tell you how I would approach different lesions. These are all dissections from Roten. So for this, for this area in the mesencephalon, I think a pterinal, sometimes a cranioorbital approach might be useful. For this approach here in the lateral aspect of the midbrain, a transylvian half and half, sometimes through the tentorium. 
I like the Kawazi approach for the upper pons, uh, but not below seventh and eighth nerve. I love the supracerebellar infratentorial approach. It has three variants, as you know, midline, paramedian, and extreme lateral. If I want to approach the collicular plate, um, sometimes the posterior interhemispheric transtentorial approach, if the lesion is too high, but I like to do it with the right with the hemisphere down, not with a, a, a neutral position, so that you don't have to retract and you can do lumbar drain. Midline suboccipital telovelar, of course, excellent for the floor of the fourth ventricle. We, of course, should not forget the very useful retrosigmoid approach with all its variations. And I'll show you later a video of one variation. Uh, sometimes, not very common, a more involved skull-based approach, such as the pre-sigmoid subtemporal retrolab approach, and uh, very unusual for a cavernoma, most commonly used for an extensive petroclival meningioma. Far lateral approach is extremely useful for the pontomedullary junction. Again, I may have time to show you some case examples. So let's go over case examples. Uh, let's start with, I won't have time to show you everything I want to show you, so I'll go quickly. Midbrain, rostral midbrain. I'll show you an example where I use the posterior interhemispheric supracollicular transpineal gland. Uh, this is a video. I am going, of course, to speed through it. Uh, this, is, this is the lesion. You can see it well. Uh, the question is, here is on coronal, here is on sagittal, what's the best approach? I thought this would be the best approach. Uh, Inter-hemispheric, uh, transtentorial, I do the crany across the midline, I took a small bridging vein, there is no retraction, just a lumbar drain. Here I am marking the straight sinus to be able to cut the tentorium, which you can see right here. Once I cut the tentorium, I have a very good view of the vein of Rosenthal and vein of Galen. You can see them here. The key then is not to enter the superior colliculus, but here, right here is the pineal gland. Using navigation, it was clear that I should go through the pineal gland and that gave me right, right there, the hematoma cavity and the excellent view of, of the cavernoma without having to deal with the collicular, superior or inferior colliculi. And then I resected the cavernoma. The view was excellent. You can see the brain is in good shape. And here is a, a gross total resection at the end. Patient did beautifully. Uh, so I want to remind you the pineal gland can be uh, a site of entry. Uh, caudal midbrain. I want to show you uh, a patient who has operated elsewhere, had failed a telovelar approach because I, that was not the correct approach and came to me and I did a supracerebellar infratentorial, the extreme lateral variant. And I'll show you that. I'm, I'm going to skip the history. Here is the original hemorrhage in this young patient. Uh, you can see there uh, the, the cavernoma, you can also see that there is a DVA uh, covering the cavernoma. So the other surgeon somehow went through the floor of the fourth ventricle, but could not remove the lesion because the DVA was in his way. You can see the DVA here. And he only did a small resection and left most of the lesion behind. The patient recovered well. Six months later, she was referred to me with this lesion. So then, of course, the best approach, you can see a very nice view of the DVA. The best approach is really supracerebellar infratentorial. And uh, you can see why with the yellow arrow. And I'll show you the view. Now, uh, I, I don't use the sitting position for various reasons, not because I don't like it, but because of anesthetic issues and uh, we don't have the nice setup that, of course, Professor Sami has popularized. But the Concord position, 
is very good. Uh, this is what I did. This is a Concorde position. You can clearly see I have no self-retaining retractor. Concorde means the head and the trunk of the patient are elevated to try to get the benefits of a semi-sitting position. And it works fine for me. I, I have not really used the sitting position in a long time. Uh, but you can see the fourth nerve in the middle of the exposure. You can see the cavernoma, the superior cerebellar artery. And of course, it's very easy. Once you find it, the rest is easy. Uh, I'm working infratrochlear below the fourth nerve. And coagulating into the cavernoma, not into the wall of the brain stem, of course, using surgery cell, piecemeal removal, a, a two, a sometimes uh, like we do with acoustic neuromas, the SAMI technique of traction, counter traction with a very fine forceps. And then, uh, and there you can see the wall of the resection very clean after I'm finished. And I sometimes use an endoscope to assist and look to make sure I haven't missed anything. And here, when we're done, the cerebellum looks very good, even though we're in a Concorde uh, position. And the view is excellent. And here is a resection, a complete resection. Uh, patient, again, did very well. I did give her a partial, not a partial, a fourth nerve palsy that disappeared several weeks later. Um, that's post-op, that's a DVA that was preserved. I'll show you an example of the rostral pons. It's a pregnant woman uh, from Panama. Uh, I'll, I'll skip through the history. Look, they gave her steroids. They told her her lesion was inoperable. She became cushionoid and could not walk. She's in a wheelchair from steroids and from this lesion. You can see it here. The, the mistake would be to do this telovelar, even though the two-point method would tell you, you you should do it that way. That's wrong because you're going to give her a facial nerve palsy. So the, ob, the better approach is simple subtemporal. And that's what I did. We monitored the fetus during surgery. Here is a fetal heartbeat and a simple approach for what is a, a formidable lesion. I removed it completely, and here she is post-op. Her the third nerve palsy was unchanged. Feet. Her hemiparesis uh, got better immediately. Um, I believe I probably have time for one more example, so I'd like to finish perhaps with this one. Uh, the variations on the retrosigmoid approach are endless, so I want to to again remind maybe the younger colleagues yeah, of what the, case the petrosal uh, fissure or the so-called horizontal fissure is, think of it as a sylvian fissure of the posterior fossa and split it. So this is a lesion in a young woman who hemorrhaged. You could do, a, I, so I thought I'll do a retrosigmoid, but it was a little posterior and I needed to enter the middle cerebellar peduncle. The best way I found at surgery is to split that horizontal fissure. And I'm going to show you. So here is how I do the retrosigmoid. We get CSF uh, at the, the near cisterna magna. Then we dissect, of course, no retraction needed. You can see seven and eight. Now here is nice schematics of where we are. The next step, instead of retracting the cerebellum, is to split the horizontal cerebellar fissure. So you can see, I'm sorry, I skipped too quickly. You can see the superior petrosal vein. Here is the horizontal petrosal fissure. Here are the superior semilunar nodule and inferior semilunar nodule. You go between them. I'm reminding you where that is on a cadaveric specimen. And you see now that it is split. Look at the view of the fifth nerve exiting the pons. And now I can enter exactly. You can see where I'm entering right there at the middle cerebellar peduncle right here. You Unless you retract the cerebellum, you couldn't get this view if you if we had not split 
that fissure and now the cavernoma is resected and the rest is really easy but again here it is at the end and it's there is a post-op uh, and i excuse there you can see the tract of the entry splitting that fissure was very useful in doing that here she is post-op doing perfectly well now uh, I think I should stop because I think I'm over my time uh, and uh, to... Yes, Professor uh, Morcos. Thank you very much. No more time. Exactly. Thank you very much for this beautiful presentation about the safe entry points of the brainstem focused in cavernoma surgery. Any question from the panelists? I think Keiki has a question. Myself, yes. Thank you very much, Jacques. Very interesting and good, good concept. Um, I'm wondering whether you make use of DTI in your planning process for these brainstem cavernomas, and you are not made a mention of it. I'm sure you're using that. Yeah, I did. I skipped through many examples. Uh, definitely. Yes. Very important. Very useful. I agree. Okay. Again, thank you very much, uh, Professor Morcos. Uh, we know that you have a busy day today and uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Our, our next speaker is Professor Fred Gentili from Canada. He's professor oh, of- sorry, sorry, Dr. Matthias. I have apologized on his behalf at the beginning of this session. Perhaps you were not- Okay, there. okay. He's sick and uh, Professor Francesco Tomasello will be oh, next. Yes, yes and sure. You will have the title he will- Professor yes. Tomasello, you have the title of his presentation, aren't you? From day one. Okay, I can tell the title. Yes. Professor Tomasello yes, is going to go or uh, talk about CP angle, microsurgical approach to retrosigmoid to the different pathology. He has a vast experience and we all know Professor Tomasello. He is an honorary president. He is uh, chairman emeritus and uh, highly approached for many webinars and educational activities. Professor Francesco. Thank you, Imad. And I thank also Vladimir for inviting me and uh, in this excellent webinar. I enjoyed it very much, but I fear that we are late and we need to leave uh, some time to uh, Professor Sami, so I can make, if you agree, um, my presentation as short as I can, because uh, uh, we need to, to leave time to Professor Majid Sami. I can share the, the... Okay, the, the title of my presentation is Retromastoid Approach for uh, uh, microsurgery of cerebellopontine angle lesions. And uh, I had uh, the great privilege, the university, my university has the, had the great privilege to award the Professor Sami with the gold medal in uh, April 2015. Uh, you cannot see the presentation. Why? I, I, I have the screen in the, Can you see or not? Not. But we see only your desktop. Okay. We have to open the presentation ahead of time, perhaps. Okay, excuse me. I share the screen. No, you must open the presentation. No. Excuse me. I, I see the I see the, the presentation on my screen and the, I don't see the presentation and you don't see the presentation. 
Yeah. We can't see your presentation. So when you share the screen, can you share the desktop and then try to find your presentation from the desktop, Professor Tomasello? Yes. Excuse me. I can. I can. I, this is my destiny. It was my destiny that I cannot make this presentation for you. I, I apologize. Well, I have a small suggestion. I, I went through the same exercise. Yes. If you check out before yes. you join the link again yes. and put your presentations on screen for yourself and then join us. Okay. It, it, it was, uh, I was doing this just uh, to have a, uh, okay. I, I can go, excuse me. Okay, I have the, the, the presentation on my screen. Okay. I share my screen. And you see my, my presentation now or not? No. Oh. It be uh, like a desktop uh, picture. Uh, you must leave the Zoom meeting and no, then can, come back. Yeah, yeah or, or, or minimize the... Okay. I okay. think okay. he has to leave the Zoom meeting first. Check okay. out completely. Okay. And put the presentation and then join the link again. There are some questions on the question and answer chat box. So I suppose it's probably for Professor Basso and some of the other speakers. So if you could look into that, uh, that'll be great. I, we can't yes. hear you, Professor Thomas. Uh, can you unmute? Yes. Yes. Uh, if I uh, uh, push the button on my screen, I share the screen, and you don't see my screen. No. We see, no. We see your screen, but not your presentation. I, I see my presentation now. Um. Yeah, I think you unshare it and then try to minimize this Zoom window, maybe, and then you can see your presentation and put it on the desktop first. I have my presentation on my desktop. I, I don't understand why uh, it's not the first webinar I I, I participate. See, uh, I, you were with us several times in the past. Uh, oh, probably, probably. Okay, if it's impossible, uh, uh, Imad, I, I may renounce because. Uh, oh, okay, no problem. No. I don't, I don't want to take uh, uh, too, too, too much time to the, to the lecture of uh, Professor Sam. Your presence was important for us. Your presentation will be rescheduled for future webinars. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, we thank you very much, but please stay with us to the end. So we are all listening to. <laughs> now to the lecture of Majin Sami. Okay. Uh, is uh, Vladimir with us? Vladimir? Vladimir? I can't see Vladimir anywhere here. Okay. If not, then on behalf of the all the members of the New Anatomy Committee and all the panelists, and all the people, young and senior neurosurgeon around the world, would like to welcome Professor Majid Sami to give his presentation. We are all excited to hear about his presentation in the field of teaching and education. Professor Sami, are you with us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, I will try to share my presentation. 
with you just a moment. You can see now. Yes? Uh, not yet. I think you haven't shared the screen yet. Yeah, now we can. We can see that. Yes. Um, we haven't got, we can't see the presentation yet. Um, yes. It's okay. Yeah, that's fine. You can make it a slide. A slide so, yeah, that's slide view. Yeah, that's good. It's okay. <clears throat> good. It's good. I think, my dear uh, <laughs> Imad and Vladimir, uh, it is a long day. And uh, uh, first of all, of course, I would like to thank you and all my colleagues who gave such excellent lectures. And uh, they have made me very happy. Very happy to see that uh, the neurosurgery in all our continent has a wonderful has reached a wonderful level in benefit of our patients. I'm not going to give a lecture um, on uh, uh, details of neurosurgical techniques. This has been described by many of you yesterday and today. I want to talk about the education and the duty and joy of education I had in my life in neurosurgery. And if I want to start, what was the origin of my ambition and everything which was really motivated me to go this way, I look at two pictures first. One is, as I was uh, uh, at the primary school here in the age of 11, at that time, my uncle, Ibrahim Sami, <clears throat> he has in 1948, he has um, um, inaugurated the first chair of neurosurgery at the most important uh, Iranian University, Tehran University. And I was, of course, I it was uh, the member of the family and uh, I heard about his success that uh, he can open the head and see the brain and try to operate on brain. And that was really uh, the most, uh, I would say, important uh, turning point of my life in the childhood. Professor Sami was, Ibrahim Sami uh, was uh, the man who, uh, his father was a, a diplomatic person, was minister of uh, foreign minister and was ambassador in many countries. And, and at that time before, as he was at the school, his father was ambassador in Germany and he went to the school in Germany and finished the school in Berlin. Uh, where all the ambassadors were. And then he went to Munich and studied medicine. And finally, in, in uh, 1937, uh, as I was born, he finished uh, then the medical school. And it came the war and he had to work in Bad Eibling, one of the hospitals close to Munich, uh, general surgery. He was trained in general surgery. and. During the, he has uh, found uh, great interest in, uh, in neurosurgery. And at that time, neurosurgery was still in Europe and everywhere not uh, developed. Even we had not that uh, in 1945, uh, after the war, uh, even the, the first chair in uh, Germany was not uh, uh, created. So he went to Zurich together with Kreinbühl, who was uh, developing that department, working with him. He had his experiences during the war and uh, three years later, then he came to Iran and started to build his school. I had in that age, 
And certain feeling in my life in the school when I listened to teachers. And I had the feeling some of the boys uh, didn't understand the problems of the lessons. And after the school, I was always working with them to uh, teach them what is the problem and to learn. I enjoyed that so much. That was not only in primary school, also in the secondary school. And as I came uh, to uh, University of Mainz in, uh, in Germany, st started to study medicine, um, I started medicine. Could you, could you hear me? Yes? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. no problem. Yes. By the word, because I had, and then <clears> this <throat> was the same, the same thing. As a student, I was all the time working with other students and trying to prepare them for examinations. And it made me so happy to see that my uh, other Kamaliton and other students, they could get success and then they could, I had even one of the students felt down through the examination two times. And in the third time I took him and I worked with him daily and night. And finally he finished the examination with me. And that was my greatest achievement at that time. Anyway, then I met my uh, sure. teacher, Professor Kurt Schirmer. Really, I must say this man was an important mm -hmm. person in my life, it was a great man in his personality. And he came from a very good family, he was very well educated and his treatment was always like a gentleman. I am sure if I would not started with him, probably I would not continue to uh, continue my way, which I have done uh, with him together. And uh, in 1966, I started with him with the neurosurgery. I started already as student and I have the thesis of doctor thesis I went with him. And uh, 1964, I started um, uh, in a neurosurgery. And I had interest at that time, I said, uh, I would like to, uh, I heard from Donaghy and also Jacobson that in the experimental uh, work, uh, they have um, advocated uh, microsurgery in neurosurgery. And uh, then I have asked him, I could have a microscope. He immediately gave me the permission. And then I received the OPMI eye, OPMI eyes, that was the first uh, operating microscope from size, and I started then to use an experimental department, and then with the first step was to uh, use it for uh, for peripheral nerve. And interesting was that at that time, as I started the microsurgery, uh, in the same time. I had this gentleman you see here uh, that after a couple of years, I could uh, uh, exchange with them because the other neurosurgeon, they had no uh, experiences, no ideas about the microsurgery. Very interesting was the Corsi and Rand from uh, Los Angeles. I met them and uh, with Rand, I played also golf and Lenny Malis, these three person, were the person who could then with me exchange experiences on uh, acoustic neurinoma. And uh, with Ghazi and Charlie Drake, I was exchanging with them on, and later with Sujita about aneurysm and AVMs. So that when we met each other, we were discussing about different type of AVM, different type of aneurysm, how to clip the aneurysm and so with them. But with, with Jules Hardy, 
with him. I was very closely uh, uh, connected as friend and we played also golf together from Canada. And I spoke with him about the pituitary gland and exchanging than our ex microsurgical experiences, because he started also in the same time. But on the top, I must say, uh, the um, Janetta was um, really, we become very close friends and we exchanging our ideas. I was impressed by him as he showed me the first cases he used uh, microsurgical decompression of the cranial nerves in trigeminal nerve particularly. And, uh, and I started also in Europe, I believe I was the first who started in Europe to use the macro uh, surgery for vascular decompression. And in the beginning, I, I couldn't understand very well, but I had one in meeting after six months with him. We were sitting in a bar. I told uh, Peter, I am not very convinced. I said, look, and he gave me really a private <laughs> lecture on that, that the, the compression has to be done just at brainstem. Because I did it, I was afraid to go to for instance, you must imagine in, uh, uh, in the time, uh, 69 and uh, 80, uh, six, uh, 70, uh, we had not, we had experiences in that area, but, but I was very careful. And then I understood that and I, I came back and started and it was successful. And then I told him here, uh, Peter, because I was active in, uh, in facial nerve and peripheral nerve and so, I said, I think it is time uh, to organize together one World Congress on cranial nerves, which was done in 1980 and 81, we published that book. I think that is the only really reference book which existing in the world is still, which is now, uh, about um, 40 years um, old, that all cranial nerves has been here. I had by myself 13 uh, articles in this book. Now, interesting thing was my, uh, uh, my uh, I would say, experience in a meeting with uh, Hanno Milesi, who was a plastic surgeon. He, because I was interested in peripheral nerve, and he gave a lecture in Wiesbaden once uh, and demonstrated his about 12 cases he did uh, he did uh, nerve grafting and and the result was impressive but I didn't believe him and I said my goodness and I went home in Mainz and I started to make experimental work uh, uh, in um, peripheral nerve I tried to do end-to-end -end suture and put down resection of five millimeter of the uh, sciatic nerve of rabbit and then bring the end uh, to end under uh, little pressure and uh, little tension, I'm sorry. And then I put ner graft, nerve grafting. This was one of the major experimental work. And finally I found that the results of nerve grafting is much better with auto locus nerve graft without tension, even better if you do end to end suture, uh, you do end to end suture with under pressure. And, and you can see the difference. And then I was convinced that I have to work on that. And I was done the team of at that time existing. Uh, Mich Jacques Michon, uh, Michon from Nancy, and Smith was from from um, uh, New York, and uh, Milesi from Austria, and myself. We were a team of peripheral nerve microsurgery operator. In neurosurgery, we had nobody was interested first uh, to to use the microscope for peripheral nerve, and uh, I was It was fascination for me that. I can divide the peripheral nerve 
medianus or sciatic nerve in smaller anatomical units, and then I can make a cooperation uh, adaptation of the this fascicle much nicer and much better together. And at that time, of course, uh, that was my very strong uh, scientific work, and uh, I published many papers on experimental work on peripheral nerve. And then I have done uh, introduce uh, uh, some uh, uh, classification because then uh, just fascicular neurolysis was for me. I, I had unbelievable experiences and good outcome, so that. Uh, uh, I started to use the sural nerve for not only usual peripheral nerve, but in entire body. And I saw so fantastic results. And then of course extended it to brachial plexus with root evulsion, uh, as you see here. Then I tried to use uh, all possibilities with the uh, intercostal phrenic accessory nerve also to the different arm nerve when all the root was evolved. You can see, I don't want to stick on that, but you can see here, for example, I used even as I had a lot of experience with hypoglossofacial anastomosis, in some case, I have used also hypoglossofacial in 82 and anastomosis with the muscular cutaneous with such a fantastic result. Also, I had also here a root evulsion in the lumbar region that is a, a patient, a young girl who came then later uh, uh, with uh, complete quadriceps paresis with, uh, I found in the myelography an uh, L3, 4, and 5 uh, left side uh, uh, root evulsion. And in this case, as you see here, contrast medium reflux, I had an idea why, when I do the fish crossover anastomosis, a healthy side to the, to the um, paralyzed side, why I cannot use it in the femoral nerve? So that I introduced then the femoral femoral anastomosis and later, of course. And so I had all these ideas and that, and this uh, girl after one, one and a half year, he could use then quadriceps uh, muscle very well. Of course, at that time, the, we started also to use the replantation of extremities. And I was very, very interested to make the reconstruction because I was working also in the vascular anastomosis as well as the, uh, the nerve anastomosis. You can see also the successful death. In the cranial nerves, for example, uh, for um, alveolar mandibular nerve. When I work with a maxillofacial surgeon, we remove this, for example, Adaman genoma here, and we did a complete res resection. And then I have, uh, I have done try to make, take a sural graph and reconstruct that. You can see here the, uh, the uh, sensory loss and then it recovered very well. Interesting is this case that I have, uh, I have seen in a meeting in Graz in Austria uh, and the professor for ophthalmology, as he saw, he saw uh, my lectures and Milesi lecture, they came to both of us and say, what can you do? I have a patient, a 12 years boy, who is blind on one side and on the other side, he has keratitis neuroparalytica and the corneal three times we have tried to do a uh, corneal transplant, but it is not working. And then I had immediately the idea why we cannot take a, a graft and anastomose the occipital major uh, and make a frontal, frontal craniotomy and open an orbit. At that time, you must imagine 69. And, and I did this surgery in the, in the operating theater of, in grass in uh, ophthalmological department. And so that I did the uh, frontal lateral approach and I, took, I exposed the occipital major nerve. I took the sural nerve and anastomose together, which was of course very, very 
uh, uh, interesting. And we had done this in several cases successfully. But these enormous good results of nerve grafting, of course, then gave me uh, the chance uh, as I started 1968 with microsurgery of vestibular schwannomas to say we should in any case when the facial nerve is not preserved, then I can then make a graft between central stem and peripheral stem. And you can see this is one of the, those cases I have done in that time, that is a tumor and that is the brainstem and here is internal auditory canal. That is the patient here you can see nine months later here and you see 18 months later, I was fascinated about such results. In 1975, I have modified the dot operation which was intracranial, extracranial nerve grafting with a long graft. I have then uh, modif modified this technique with their intracranial intrapetrosol. I said, why I cannot make a mastoidectomy and have the fallopian canal, the facial nerve, and bring then the uh, graft from CP angle here through the anterior to sigmoid sinus and anastomose that. 75, that was my first case I have done. As you see here, that is, uh, uh, that is the brain stem, central stem, that is the graft. And then anterior to sigmoid size, I made a hole and take the second end of the graft and brought then to the mastoidectomy and tried to, uh, try to anastomose with the uh, uh, fallopian canals uh, portion of the facial nerve here. And you can see this is the patient of that time. And if I saw this lady, uh, and I saw this uh, result, you can imagine uh, how uh, you are, you get motivation to do more and more in this field. Here, one example of, uh, of the Recklinghausen disease that the patient had a, a, a schwannoma of facial nerve as well as the trigeminal nerve. This is only an example you can see with all grafts I have tried to reconstruct this and this is the patient with recovery. All these recoveries uh, and, uh, and options in peripheral nerves including brachial plexus needed to be distributed to my colleague worldwide. This is a similar feeling as I had as a child in the school or as a student. You know. Not only because I was, um, I, I have seen that um, not only by lectures during Congress, but also organizing practical courses. In 1970s, I started the macrosurgical courses on peripheral nerves together with Hanno Milesi, and we had participants, not only neurosurgeon, we had hand surgeon and neuro, also plastic surgeon, and once was in Vienna, once was in, in uh, Mainz. So in the same time, I have organized worldwide practical courses with live surgeries to teach microsurgery for those young neurosurgeons who could not travel to Europe. And uh, this is a very interesting case as I organized the first microsurgical course in Tehran in Iran. Then uh, I was in the hospital and suddenly some of the doctors came and, and, and had it uh, in a sock in the hand, in the hand which was, uh, uh, was uh, transected and uh, shot me. And I have decided then to go to operating theater and I work about six, seven hours to anastomose the arteries and veins together. And I, and you see here, and then later, then I did as a reconstruction of the, that was the successful uh, uh, replantation in 1971, which I have done in Tehran. Despite of iron wall, I traveled to all East European countries. I think, the Florian and many others also, um, Vladimir and the others, they are witness how often I was um, in, 
uh, in particularly in uh, West Europe, uh, which was not very popular for our uh, East uh, 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 West um, uh, neurosurgical societies. And I have organized three times. One of my pupils at that time was Winko Dolenz, who came always to Mainz to learn microsurgery. And he asked me, can I help him to organize uh, in Ljubljana? I have organized three very successful microsurgical courses on peripheral nerve in Ljubljana. And I could get a lot of uh, colleagues from uh, from the East Europe to come there. And I asked also the uh, company size uh, to bring microscope there because there was not so many microscope at that time there. In West Europe, I organized, of course, um, 1973 uh, uh, microsurgical courses in different countries uh, for two days. And I gave always every day six lectures and and one of them uh, was in in France in Toulouse I was invited by uh, Professor Lazard at that time and I gave 12 lectures in that and what they have done they have uh, recorded all my lectures which was each one about one hour and discussion uh, and uh, Professor uh, Lagaric and Lazard, they have done, made from my 12 lectures, the first in French language book on aspects modern de la chirurgie de peripheral, uh, their nerve peripheric. And this is, uh, was then published that the, my colleagues in France will then appreciate to read whatever I have done during this time. In the same year, also 1973, I was invited by Professor Scoville as guest of honor in the Colby College who organized every year an educational course for all young American neurosurgeons. And, um, oh, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> Why it doesn't go ah, here. And you can see this picture. It's a very historical picture. You see, there is Professor uh, Scovel, and I was the guest of honor. And this is the top neurosurgeons of North America at that time. Here, John Ronsahoff, and you see uh, Jill Hardy, and, uh, and also the pediatric neurosurgeon also here. And, uh, and here you can see the Peter Janeta. And in this, uh, in this meeting, I gave, I don't know, six, seven lectures on peripheral cranial nerve and, and many uh, uh, topics. And Joe Ranzohoff was editor of the, a very important book, which was Modern Aspect of Neurosurgery. I asked me to write the chapter of the peripheral nerve, which I I wrote at that time, which was were very well uh, welcome in the United States. And of course, in uh, uh, the same time, of course, I, I, I have done in 1981, I started with microsurgical courses in India and China, in each country with more than 1 billion uh, inhabitants, there were only 200 uh, neurosurgeons in, the, in India. Keki Turel uh, was one of my uh, uh, pupils at this course and, and also Dr. Misra was assisting me. I did not all the lectures, but I did also life surgeries, several in that time uh, in, in New Delhi. And uh, I have additionally started to organize what I have done in Toulouse, also for neurosurgery in different countries, Ukraine or many, many countries. That is uh, in Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, I spoke two days, again, every day, six uh, lectures on, on entire neurosurgery from peripheral nerve to brain stem, skull basin, whatever vascular decompression, pain and and, uh, and, and they have recorded all my uh, lectures and 
they have them distributed. At that time, Bangladesh, they had hundreds of uh, neurosurgeons and they have them distributed uh, to all hundreds of uh, neurosurgeons took at home and they always met me, asked me and told me, Professor Sami, every weekend, we are going also to watch you uh, in your, for your lectures and we learn and learn and we do our surgery much better. Of course, important point, turning point was my idea about skull-based surgery. The word skull-based surgery were not existing, is not existing in any textbook. And at that time, I had the idea why I came to that. I saw that with the microsurgery, I can see the structures much easier at, uh, from inside uh, to the skull base and from outside. And, and, and that was uh, the reason that I tried also to look at the literature. I found that there is, of course, in ENT neurosurgery, maxillofacial surgery, there have been some approaches to the skull base, but all either from outside, from autological point of view, or the, from inside of the, of the skull. And here you see the pioneers of neurosurgery, the pioneers of ENT, and here maxillofacial. And, but my philosophy of the skull-based surgery was overcoming this, this barrier, which was existing between uh, the, uh, other disciplines in order to solve the problem for a pathology. My personal experiences in more than half a century were based on learning. I think I enjoyed very much uh, also the dis description of uh, uh, explanation of uh, Florian who tried to bring uh, my, some of my ideas. I tried to optimize of surgical processes and, uh, and of course the goal of the of learning curve was achieving a total resection of the pathology when benign tumors was of course, and is still today a challenge. Of course, for the malignant tumor, of course, is impossible and we had to sacrifice nerves or whatever. The learning curve showed me, as Florian said, more simple approaches is less risk of morbidity and we can achieve best results. We have learned simpler makes it safer. Less extend, extensive, unnecessary approaches, less complications in benign uh, pathology. How we can learn to avoid unnecessary extensive approaches. I have heard today that a multi-angular approach on, or not and so, but I will explain how it works in the brain of neurosurgeons. Yeah. I think by introduction of operative microscope and endoscope and navigation, slowly, slowly we have learned to reduce the huge exposure, which I have done together with, I have unbelievable uh, cases to show you how much we have exposed <laughs> with the craniotomy in any direction. And then, but much more by, much more is, uh, I'm sorry, I have to, there was, much more what I have learned was systematic enucleation of, of, the, of the lesions. And uh, what are the facts? The facts is a skull-based space occupying lesions changing the normal anatomy. I was happy that Jacques was talking similar for the intra as a pontine or the intermesencephalic uh, anatomy, which is also changed uh, in the pathological anatomy. And that is that what we have to know. N learning normal anatomy is very important, but how we can learn the pathological anatomy. Yeah. And, uh, and that, is, that is that because they change completely 
the normal anatomy. I wrote a, a preface for a rotten book and I described exactly because I admired him so much. He was one of my best friends in exposure of the anatomy, but I was always telling him, look, it is wonderful to be bewildered, but if they want to expose all this anatomy, what you have, you are describing the world for reaching a tumor, they can destroy many vessels, many nerves uh, in this surgery. And thanks Paxi's brain, vascular system and cranial nerves are compressed and displaced, as I mentioned, in any benign tumor. Fact is that they are under mechanical pressure and therefore very much fragile. When carotid is compressed, and if you go around the tumor to see the carotid, you rupture the carotid. I have seen in, by many people that they are doing, and therefore it is. it was even of the nerves, they are stretched. If you go around and you just touch one time the nerve, the function is gone. And with enucleation, we decompress all surrounding structures and in the same time, visualizing the arachnoid membrane. I was happy that today, uh, um, uh, my really loved all the people, uh, uh, the Amirati spoke only about arachnoid membrane, the same, the Florian and also Professor Basso and many of you were talking about the arachnoid membrane visualizing. When we can see the arachnoid membrane, when we have enucleated enough the tumor, and then the capsule had a space between the tumor and, and the, the arachnoid membrane. This is a fact, and we must understand that one day, if we have not understood, then we have to really realize that. Surrounding um, important a a structure are not anymore under pressure. But that is also, and um, and they can safely detach arachnoid, detach from the from the lesion. The best entry, that is what uh, uh, Jacques has has demonstrated very well in his lecture into the lesion should be free of arteries, venous drainage, and cranial nerves. The brainstem dissection, when we have a large tumor, should be approached at very end after real enucleation. Key conclusion is enucleation without exposure of, without exposure of, uh, Without exposure of, uh, uh, I'm sorry here, they are all neurosurgeons. I don't know why they are calling me. <laughs> anyway, and uh, and uh, without exposure of brainstem, venous, arterial, and cranial left. This is my philosophy today. With this philosophy, I have started to change the primary idea of neurosurgery. And, and and instead complete exposure of the pathology that was that was the that was that was the idea of the of the people uh, 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 as I started with even gliomas we had to go around the glioma with a spatula and remove it so that I personally abounded that and in order uh, to say then uh, and the removal of the pathology uh, will then uh, do then directly when we come in a safe area to the pathology and enucleate and then go around that. The development of a skull-based surgery, of course, was were based on following um, um, aspects. Interdisciplinary cooperation, we heard about that, we started in 1968. Microsurgery, I started in 1966. After five years, you know, microsurgical uh, courses, 1971, I started to distribute our knowledge. And of course, this introduction of CT and MRI was 
it was very, very important and selective angiography and embolization. You can imagine in, in uh, chemodectoma or the uh, paraganglioma. And so I had to operate 12, 14 hours because we had no embolization and later become much easier. Then interoperative navigation. I had the first brain lab in Hanover in 1990 and endoscopy where we are discussing about that. You know, my friend uh, Drab was a pioneer of endoscopy in the paranasal sinuses. And the first book, extensive book, is from him, which was uh, published. Therefore, we had all the time together. We had uh, the uh, endoscope to use it. And so that I, uh, I didn't need to learn how to use the endoscope. And therefore, when we have opened the uh, INI in Hanover, in every operating theater, beside of microscope is an endoscope. Then interoperative neuromonitoring, I started with hearing uh, monitoring, and so in 1970. And of course, the neuroanesthesiology anest post-operative intensive care become more and more important. And the skull base uh, surgery, I've, as I said, is an interdisciplinary cooperation and two fields, anterior skull base paranasal sinus, petrous bone, posterior fossa, and middle fossa. This is something that the neurosurgeon ENT have to learn how they can cooperate together when the pathology is extended intra and extracranial in this area. And at that time, as I have in, uh, started with this, my team in, uh, there were only few places they worked from time to time. For example, in Los Angeles, that was between house and uh, Hitzelberger just for the petrous bone for acoustic and in France was, was Portman and uh, Tersac and in Switzerland, Gazi Yajarkil and Fish. Uh, they didn't like each other. Uh, sometimes they were obliged to do something together. But in, um, in, uh, in Great Britain were Morrison King uh, and they were also working for acoustic, but very strong cooperation was between Lindsay Simon and Cheeseman for all pathology of, on the anterior skull, with particularly the malignant tumors with the paranasal sinuses. We have tried in Mainz, 1970, officially to create the interdisciplinary teamwork between neurosurgery, ENT, and neurosurgery. But I have included the neuroanatomy Professor Lang was one of the most prominent uh, anato neuroanatomists in Europe, I, could, I would like to say in the whole world. And after we had, we had our um, uh, experiences uh, with uh, uh, skull-based surgery, then I, I was obliged to organize courses. And the first ever course, which was uh, uh, organized for skull based surgery was 1979. And, uh, and this group, what you see, they are the first European uh, participants as a neurosurgeon and ENT. Who I, that is Professor Draft, that is myself. And that was the beginning of really enormous activity in skull based surgery. In 1980, uh, then uh, in, uh, we have in Montpellier, together with Professor Rabichon, the a genius anatomist uh, uh, of a really century, and together with me and, uh, on, on then Professor Draft and others, uh, we have done, started to create the so-called skull-based study group. And we decided every two years to organize a scientific meeting. You can see from 82, to 90, we had different topics, which we have uh, for malformation, trauma, tumors in different, uh, uh, different areas. And then I came to the idea, I have to push all my colleagues in every countries to 
push the interdisciplinary cooperation and create a national uh, and if possible, even continental skull based uh, societies. And uh, in uh, 1982, uh, we started to write the book and it was the, uh, as we have seen by Florian, that uh, this book is uh, not a book of many chapters. There is only the book, which is my and experience, my late friend together about the entire skull-based surgery from anterior fossa to the uh, uh, posterior fossa and petrous bone, everything was in trauma, malformation and tumors in this book. This is the only book existing that has been ever published by only two uh, surgeons, neurosurgeon and, and uh, an ENT surgeon. And the, the chapter of anatomy was written by Professor Lang. How I, I could distribute the skull-based surgery worldwide faster? As I said, internationally, the skull-based, additionally to, uh, to courses and, uh, and skull-based uh, congresses, creation of uh, societies. And in 1991, I, uh, uh, inaugurated the uh, German uh, uh, skull-based society. And in 92, the first World Congress of skull-based surgery I have organized in Hanover with 850 participants and 55 countries. You can imagine here, that is, uh, for example, um, uh, Professor uh, Choi from, uh, from uh, Korea on uh, Takakura from, from, uh, uh, from Japan. All these gentlemen, they have started to create in their own country skull-based societies. And I was happy that my people from the state, uh, the um, Sheka, Lelikam Shika, he has also pushed to organize the North American skull-based society. And, and these, every four years, this World Congress has been continued. The next one was in the United States and the third one was in Brazil. Professor uh, Basso and Professor Ramina have organized perfectly this meeting in Brazil and then uh, the fourth one was in Australia, and then uh, fifth one, and uh, then it was continuing uh, into the Canada, and then also in UK. And uh, this one uh, was the last one was planned for for uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro. That unfortunately, because in this year uh, the, through the pandemic, was not possible. The turning point of the more help for neurosurgery come 1997, as I become world president. After my nomination, of course, I felt a great, um, a great uh, honor. But uh, uh, in the same time, of course, uh, have uh, I had uh, enormous um, uh, um, obligation and responsibility, which was I'm feeling as I become the president of the World Federation. And, and my, uh, my opinion was how I can really make the neurosurgery for everybody better. And that was the reason that uh, I, I had the idea, I have to work in two directions. One direction is to create uh, uh, a center with all options to develop neurosurgery further. Uh, that was that, uh, and, and therefore uh, the other was how I can elevate the basic standard for developing countries. And high technology has financial, of course, limit, limitation only in few uh, places possible. And high tech, but high technology is, as we know, is fundamental even today for advancement in neurosurgery. Therefore, the plan was oriented, as I mentioned, in two directions. I have done had the plan of uh, uh, International Neuroscience Institute in Hanover. It took only two years, 
and uh, with all options. And in 21st of July, 2000, we have inaugurated and finished this building, which was uh, my idea to have in the shape of the brain. And we started down here to have the first three Tesla MRI in Europe in this from Siemens and started down here to, uh, uh, to include all possibility of diagnostic uh, and then and then, of course, we have then a computer graphic workstation, and therefore we were working. That was the time that I was very, very interested more and more how I can make a minimal invasive removal of gliomas and uh, and cavernomas and everything because we had the possibility of DTI and brain mapping. This is uh, uh, the department of the neuroradiology with everything, whatever you see, including uh, the, uh, the uh, three Tesla and uh, things. And here, then department of the surgery, uh, uh, including the intraoperative MR. And uh, more difficult was the creation of basic standard without having any financial resources in WFNS. And that was, uh, uh, the reason, uh, because I, I saw that uh, after careful evaluation of the neurosurgical situation worldwide, I found that there are countries, they have not one single neurosurgeon, particularly in Africa. At that time, I asked my second vice president to give me a report on situation of uh, neurosurgery in the world. Uh, and uh, I was shocked as Abdul Salam Hamlishi, at that time, he uh, gave me the report that in Sub-Sahara, we have only 79 neurosurgeons. That means for more than 6.6 .6 million people, only one neurosurgeon. And that was uh, the reason that I decided to create a foundation. The first money I put myself in that foundation uh, everybody was skeptic about creation and foundation in World Federation. They asked me where are the money is coming from and so. But I was very impressed from my friend as I have announced that I found, I am founding the things, uh, foundation for WFNS. Dr. Um, uh, Matrin Rodriguez was the first person who then said, Mati, the idea is great. I would like also to make some sponsorship. And I never forget that. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, later, I am thankful for Professor Basso, who uh, accept uh, my uh, desire after a certain time to take care of this foundation. But in the same time, I try to create the basic uh, neurosurgical instruments because I say when the people are educated, go home and they have uh, no uh, instrument uh, or, or the microsurgery is the uh, uh, precondition to be successful. And I spoke with company size and Escolab and they both have given me the best uh, support so that we could then uh, establish that. The other thing which I have done, which still is working very well, I have created the forum of young neurosurgeons that I say I have to include all young people into the uh, activities of the World Federation. And uh, here you can see the major purpose of foundation uh, was on ease promoting the worldwide development of neurosurgery, focusing on developing countries. And here you can see, I am talking with the president of the university in Rabat and uh, Professor Hamlishi, and I have nominated the uh, um, Morocco because I was convinced that Hamlishi has really learned the modern neurosurgery. He was always active to follow my philosophy. And then I said, he will be then able to organize this. And he took this responsibility and fight with the government university to, give, to get the permission for education. And um, 
Particularly, why I have decided to do the education in Africa, because I didn't want to make that uh, mistake which John F. Kennedy did in 1961, that he has brought hundreds of uh, top level students from Africa, from different countries, Africa to United States, and they have educated in United States. None of them then went back to Africa. And my idea was that we have to transfer the knowledge to the brain, our African colleagues. And, uh, and therefore, I said, we start the education in one of, the, oh, by the way, one of those uh, people was the father of Obama, who became then president. I started, of course, to give lectures many times, the courses which we organized in uh, in Rabat and uh, the same time, and that is the, uh, the set of uh, basic cranial set, which we have about 100, 150 piece, pieces, and the same uh, spinal set, and you see the microscope, which is still after uh, so many times, more than 25 years, is still the price of this microscope, which is working, is $100, not more. And I am thankful to company of size that keeping on this. These are the first people that with our foundation, uh, uh, the World Federation, become neurosurgeon in Rabat. And uh, here, the courses we have organized in Rabat, this is from 2011. But since then, I have been participating in every of the courses. I want to thank Hamli, Professor Hamlishi and his staff for, uh, for supporting all uh, African neurosurgeons. And uh, 10 years later, uh, I asked uh, Professor Hamlishi what happened with the number, but I was very disappointed because the number 79, despite was by our support, was only 142 patients, uh, two uh, colleagues in the sub startup and stayed of 6.6, now about 5 million people had. And I remember that um, in September 2011, during one of the uh, world, uh, uh, AC meeting, I, uh, I, uh, I have criticized the president and so, and that, that I am not happy about the development uh, and, uh, and they, they then, uh, in the, and, and this the meeting, they changed the situation and they told me, no, Professor Sammy, you have started at that time with, uh, with uh, Africa. We would like to nominate you as an ambassador for Africa. Okay, and then as ambassador of Africa, I was thinking, what can I do for Africa? We need much more trainees and training center, I said for full education neurosurgery in developing countries. And I had, of course, uh, to go because I said time is very important not to lose time during my four years presidency. Uh, la later as, as, as ambassador, I'm sorry. And then this project has been initiated Africa 100 to improve the quality and, qu and the quantity of neurosurgeons uh, in all uh, continent of Africa, uh, particularly in the uh, Sub-Sahara. And uh, Africa 100 uh, was planned that young, intelligent African should be neurosurgery, should be uh, trained in neurosurgery for five to six years. And of course, uh, I decided to carry the, the patronage of this project, regulation of the budget, place of training. First ambassador meeting, I am so happy that Professor uh, Kroish Koreshi has very nicely demonstrated uh, this meeting, which was in Nairobi, Kenya on 27, 28 January, 2012 uh, with uh, two purposes. Uh, I have announced the vision and modalities of Africa 100 in this meeting. And a committee of African neurosurgeons has been established during this meeting. And uh, the committee of African neurosurgeons announced 
the project and selected the candidates cross through the all Africa. I am thankful to Mahmoud Goreshi, who I nominated as uh, general secretary for this meeting. And he worked very hard to really distribute all the guidelines for everything that was necessary in order to get the candidates and then transfer to the training center. And uh, in 2013, the training started in Rabat. And in the meantime, the number of the candidates and training centers have been extended. All candidates who finished their education are working in their home country successfully. In the, um, uh, <clears throat> in the meantime, of course, the number of training centers has been extended. Algier and many other uh, countries have started uh, uh, to, to, support, uh, to support that. Additionally, I am happy as Professor uh, Koreshi mentioned, happy my suggestion in Nairobi to create a strong voice of Africa with Continental African Association of Neurosurgical Society has been established which uh, 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 presents uh, more than 40, uh, uh, 45 uh, uh, African countries. And I'm happy that the uh, current president is uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Horeshi at the present time. And I, I am, I, as you know, they are now very, very uh, actively working for for all the projects which we have in, in, uh, in Africa. And here I will show you an example of uh, one of the training. And also in the Lagos State University. In, in Sokoto. Uh, teacher hospital in Lagos. There. And they had limited spaces for residents. Can you train. hear that? And Professor Abdusalam El Kamlichi gladly accepted me to move to Rabat. I commenced my training there in September 2002, and I was there till September 2003. During my training, Professor Salam El Kamlichi also arranged for me to spend three weeks with Professor Majid Sami in the International Neuroscience Institute in Hanover. I came back to Sokoto, and we set up the first neurosurgery department. Eight, and the department was later upgraded to the National Center for Neurosurgery in 2007. Neurosurgeons trained from this center. Dr. Ali Laseni. I am Ali Laseni. I'm a consultant neurosurgeon. I train in Rabat Reference Center for training young African neurosurgeons. I'm the second neurosurgeon assisting my boss, Dr. Nasir Jindri Ismail. Thank you very much. Dr. Abdullah Hijimo. Hello. I'm Dr. Abdullah Hijimo, consultant neurosurgeon with Jamal University, teaching students at Kaduna State Northern Nigeria. Was trained in this center. He also had his training in Rabat, Morocco. And he has now set up a neurosurgery service in Ahmadi Bello University, where we started our training. Dr. Hassan. My name is Dr. Hassan Ismail, a neurosurgeon at Aminu Kano Teaching Hospital in Kano State, Nigeria. Kano State at the moment has about 13 million inhabitants, and this hospital serves as a referral center for the entire northeastern part of Nigeria, where there is little or no neurosurgical activity at the moment. So our yeah. current facilities, we started with the basic set of uh, neurosurgical instrument, which was proposed by Professor uh, Majid Sami. And uh, we had some couple of additions. The hospital has a 0 0.2 Tesla MRI. We have a CT scanner. We have a CM fluoroscopy. I, I and don't we have a couple to of, uh, continue because of other time. Spiral but he's instruments explaining and, uh, what they are doing. They have more than uh, every year. More than uh, two, uh, more than two thousand surgery, and uh, and very very active, and they have also five residents who are five associate, and now five resident at that time, and it is growing and growing. A, a region with eighty million people who had no neurosurgeon, and Ismail Nasiro, just one person went there and created such a situation. My dream is, 
INI Africa, future plan in, in, in Africa. And I hope I can with Mahmoud, we try it, but still we will not successful. But Mahmoud, I promise you, I will try my best to create such a center which under the African neurosurgeon will uh, then uh, train all young people in entire uh, entire uh, Africa. In China, you see this plan of the China INI, and in 2004, the government of China from Beijing, they came to Hanover, this is Lord Meyer of, uh, of Hanover, and that is the president of the university, and this is uh, Professor Ling Feng, and we have signed that I become the president of the China INI, and I should then create the similar house in Hanover, in Beijing, at the university there. These are my, at that time, my stuff. Here in the first row, there are my team from Hanover who went to Beijing, and they are all, the, at that time, our assistant. And they are now, and I have educated them more than 20 years, they came to Hanover and then we went there and here you can see the masters of uh, neurosurgery. I've nominated them to help me to educate uh, Chinese uh, neurosurgeon in courses which we have every year, one, two times with live surgery. And here you can see one of the courses with participants 2004 and 2005, every year, you can see they are the participant. The Minister of Healthcare of China, he has, they have seen that we are really uh, voluntarily helping our colleagues. They uh, have, they have, and here you can see the president of university and hospital and the director of healthcare of Beijing. They all have tried to support me to build the China INI in, in Beijing at the Capital University. And uh, I have donated then the plan of the, the donated plan of Hanover, which we had to pay at least two, three million uh, German Denmark at that time. I have donated to, to this, the university. And here uh, the Minister of Health is thanking for that. And here the Lord Mayor of, of Beijing, they all have helped and appreciated this voluntary work with uh, even the prime minister here uh, of uh, Wen Jiabao from China, which uh, wanted to thank me on all the professors who were with me to, uh, to, uh, to help the China for creation. And, um, and this is, uh, and now you can see we have in two years ago, we, we have inaugurated then China INI, which is in the middle of Beijing and here. And now I have there about 70 colleagues, doctors working in this in 14 operating theaters. And every day I have inaugurated this center two years ago. And, um, and every day 25 surgery is done in this house. And we have an enormous also option for education, other, uh, other neurosurgeons who are coming there. In Iran, we have also started and uh, finished this, but unfortunately, uh, because of the uh, problem, which political problem, the center is finished, as you see here, but is still not uh, opened. My conclusion is, my dear friends, in general, knowledge is not a private property. It is an obligation. Nobody can be proud of ability to have a special talent. The main question is, what is the origin of this talent or ability. Whatever the talent is, there is no reason to be different compared to others. Who has created these abilities? 
in this brain, in our brain. This is a gift you have received with obligation to support others in order, in order to make the life easier and nicer. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sami, for this comprehensive review of these major steps you have in your career as a great educator and mentor. Uh, no one has a doubt, a single doubt, or a grain of doubt of the greatest effort you have given worldwide and every spot of the world and including the underprivileged uh, uh, countries. Uh, and we all, uh, as I said, uh, we wish you more years to come. Of course, you were celebrated for your birthday with the family, but we are very proud to have somebody like you in the neurosurgical family who has touched the brain to make it better but touch the heart of people and humans. Uh, I think um, I have nothing to, to add. And with all respect from all my colleagues around the world, we thank you from the bottom of the heart. And we wish you many years of productive, happy life. And we can see you, you still have projects. And this is the inspiration I have put uh, as a topic that you gave us the inspiration to help others and make them happy. I think, uh, I wish I could have the chance to give everybody a potential uh, few words. Uh, perhaps I will give three, four of them because we are a bit late. So whoever wants to express his uh, <clears throat> feeling, uh, go ahead, uh, because this is the time, uh, at least on webinar for some magic, but My we'd dear. like to come and see you in person and give you our appreciation as you always give us a lot uh, to us and to our families. May I say a word, my dear Kana? Yes, yes. Yeah. Th thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kana, for giving me the opportunity just to say to Majid uh, that, uh, of course, all of us, we are uh, admiring you. And uh, uh, I would like to tell you why I am admiring you. My dear Majid, you mentioned the, 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 the course on skill base you have organized in Hanover in 1988. This is the first time I knew you and participated in this course. <clears throat> Sorry. And I remember in this large group of experts of skull base at that time, I presented six, uh, uh, I made a presentation on six cases of large cellular tumors. And you heard this presentation and you accepted this presentation in the book you have made with this course. And at the end of my presentation, you made very encouraging commentary. And this is, is very, very, very important, my dear Majid. You have shown us, every one of us has shown how you have a teaching neurosurgery worldwide, how you have helped, how what, all what you have done for developing countries, mainly for Africa. I think Africa rises, African research rises thanks to your project and to your direct engagement, not just project on paper, not just creating foundation, but engagement. You mentioned you were in all courses we organized in Rabat since 2002 uh, today more than 15 and other places in all congresses. So in addition 
to what you have done, I think <clears throat> one of the most important reasons we are also admiring you is that you are very humble. You are encor encouraging the young people who are coming, the people who are coming from difficult places, the people who are showing maybe in, in, in a meeting, uh, presentation, not with high tech, uh, not with the large background experience. And so, yeah, so I, 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 I stop here, my dear Kanan. So again, I want to just to say you, to say you, thank you so much. And why, again, what are the reasons and many others I didn't all mention, we are in admiration for you. Thank you, Magic. Can Thank I say you. something? Can I say something, Imad? Yeah, Francisco, he has Armando. waited the whole day and he privileged to say something. Oh, okay. and me, me, me too, please, Armando. Sure. Imad. Armando, sure. Me Francisco. Too. <laughs> yeah, we start with Francisco, please. Pops, uh, yes. Francisco. What's this to say? Uh, it's not unmuted. Oh, okay. uh, no, no, I am unmuted uh, now. But uh, <clears throat> what I can say, I can say that uh, Majid Sami was always close also in Europe to different uh, national societies. I can't forget that he was several times in the National Congress of Italian Society of Neurosurgery, and there was so, not only so active, but also so friendly uh, towards colleagues, but uh, also mostly towards young people, asking to him what to do in particular situations. And he was always available. So when uh, I, uh, I, I was in the uh, Co Congress of Italian Society. I was really impressed by this uh, uh, generosity of Professor Sami in uh, uh, saying everybody what he was in for real men, but also he was uh, uh, demonstrated to be true, uh, his approach to different neurosurgical diseases. This was, uh, I think, uh, uh, the best uh, I can uh, say. And last but not least, uh, he has always project, projects for education, as we saw, but uh, he has other projects for education. And I, I really uh, think that he, he, he will, uh, he will uh, uh, perform other important steps in uh, his educational activity. Uh, I can say that every one of us will be close to him for uh, this great challenge for the future of neurosurgery. Thank you, Francisco. Now we give Armando. Armando. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Imad. <clears throat> dear dear Majid, your your presentation has been the, the fantastic presentation, the best, the best I, I ever I ever heard from you. Because you know, my dear Majid, that I'm two years older than you, so I follow you in the last 50 years or your achievement. But your achievement and your personal life is the history of modern neurosurgery. Or what you have been done for for the for the modern neurosurgery and for the people and for the, the training and, 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 you know, and teaching the neurosurgeons all over the world and the witness of have you have been presenting today. Oh, I, I really I enjoy absolutely, absolutely the thing and I hope everybody think the same like me. Congratulations, Maldi Maggi, and give long to continue your fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Armando. Uh, Mario? Yes, uh, Majid, that was a brilliant, brilliant presentation. And uh, I have to say something. Each time that I hear a presentation from you, 
I feel very much energized. You have a tremendous amount of positive energy that you transmit to everybody, doesn't matter their age. And uh, I really admire you for that. And I, and I thank you for that, for your ability to transmit this energy and this positive message to everybody. Thank you. And it was a privilege to have worked with you, although for a limited thank number of years. Thanks. Thank you, Mario. Giovanni, are you still there? Yeah. Yeah, Giovanni. Oh, Your presentation was, uh, was fantastic. And uh, as, as usual. Um, I think that uh, that show uh, for many years that you are a fantastic neurosurgeon. But uh, I will say that uh, although I never had the opportunity to work with you, I learned so much with you because you are the best teacher of the worldwide neurosurgeon. And that is something that all of us have to, uh, to thank you for this. And I feel to be a young pupil of you. Okay, take care. Thank you. I think we would like, uh, Majid, if you don't mind, we'd like to have a group picture on the webinar, on the Zoom. And uh, Professor Ramesh was yep. moderating this one, if you can help us. You would like to say something, Ramesh? No, I was impressed. I mean, I mean, this, I, <laughs> no, I think that's fantastic. The, what um, uh, Prof. Maria Bratti said is fairly true. It's a positive energy whenever you hear Prof. Sami talking about and such a huge inspiration. I'm watching all the chat in the chat box from the uh, new neurosurgeons around the world. It's uh, such an inspiration for them to, to emulate Prosnami and also um, they, it gives hope. And I can see um, many, Keiki and Victor, they all want to say something. Maybe uh, one or two sentences, uh, Oimad, or you want to finish I it? Think, uh, I think it's very tiresome for Professor Sami has been the whole day with us. And I think some they have to go to their work and meet their family wherever they are. Uh, they can send some messages in person, but okay. I think uh, whatever I said, it said uh, that it will be unlimited. I'm sure I can spend another two days receiving all <laughs> the salute and the uh, inspiring these messages. So um, I'm sorry to have to we cut it, but we need to conclude with a nice. Uh, memory uh, picture. Okay. In that case, uh, we will take a, a screenshot, Iman, uh, for everyone. Um, Can we see them? Give, give us a smile, then I'll, I'll, I'll get a screenshot. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to take a screenshot. On, one second. Do you see them all? I don't see them all. We don't um, see Jack. Yeah, I have, I have uh, everyone here. Uh, but not apart from Pros uh, Jack Mokos, I think I've yeah. got the screenshot. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. I think. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Majid, for Thank this you, Prof. Ami. day and for this very successful webinar in your presence. <clears throat> my regards to your family and my wife is next to me. She said she wants to greet you as well and say hi to the family. Hi, Hello. Hello. Sammy. Hello. And Ramesh, how are you? How are you? Okay. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody, and Thank have you. a good day. I, may I, may I sure. say a few words? First of all, I'm sorry that uh, that Mahmoud wanted to say some words because he is really my right arm uh, for Africa, uh, uh, besides of Hamlishi. Uh, uh, who is really the father of the uh, of our activities? And uh, but nevertheless, what I would like to mention at the end is, you know, we are talking about the family. I have only two children. One is the son of the Delta. Amir, you know him, and uh, but believe me, all of you who have been with me in my love life, when I meet you, believe me, I have the feeling that I see my son or your, my brother, nothing else. This is in my heart. And this is something that you feel also from my side. It is not just telling, that is feeling you cannot control it. 
You cannot make a mask and then try to play something. You, you're, it is a natural behavior. And that's something that everybody will realize that. And therefore, I am the richest person in the history of human being because I have so many sons and some also daughter, even I think, and Yoko Kato and uh, 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 Lord, and many, many also. And therefore, nothing else could increase my properties in life than you all. And therefore, you can be sure that anytime, whenever I can, I will do the same I would do for my son, Amir. I will do for you, all of you, without any limitation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you so I think much. it's a very good conclusion remark. And I apologize for the others. They want to talk, but they will give me a, a waiver for this. Thank you very much, Professor Sam. Thank you. Bye. Good night, Thank everybody. You Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you to all of you. Thank you very sorry, much. Sorry, Mahmoud. Sorry about this. Uh, no, no. Absolutely. Absolutely. We will talk bye -bye. together by phone. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will. Thank you very much, bro. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. Bye, bye everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I Step couldn't up. keep it. Bye-bye. 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 B